7th Oveil, which is actually our 14th anniversary. So Oveil is officially an adolescent. Um, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> it is most definitely a good thing. So thank you all for being here. It's a, it's a special night. We have our five word challenge winners here with Judge Grace Wells. So that's going to be chock-a-block later. And um, with all of our winners and second place and third place and runners up sharing their poetry with you all today, I'd like to welcome people online, Facebook and YouTube for joining us. Thank you for being here. Um, and so without further ado, I suppose I will explain how the night is going to uh, continue. So we're going to start with the five word challenge, which is uh, a writing challenge where you, the participants, can offer up five words. There's one word per person where you will type that into the, the chat. And uh, then you'll all get 15 minutes to compose a poem with all five words, after which whoever wishes to will recite their poem. And um, then everybody listening, including people on Facebook, can vote for their favorite poem. Um, and then that person will read their poem again and we will send them a free book or two. And as we say, they can help themselves to a, a drink of their choice from their fridge. And these are the books that will be the prizes. Or you can see, because we've got a weird background. So I'll read that. Aidan Murphy, Wrong Side of Town, and Five Words, Volume 14. And after, after that, I'm going to hand you over to Paul Casey and to his capable hands, and he's going to um, look after the five word challenge and um, people that have been um, sending in their poems for the best part of the year, I suppose. Um, yeah, so the competition. So he will be looking after that. And after that, we will have our open mic session where you can share. Well, actually, because it's our anniversary, the one rule for tonight's open mic is that you can only read other people's poems. Because as you know, to write good poetry, you have to read good poetry. And it's good to, um, I suppose, honour the poets that we love and cherish for um, inspiring us on our own journeys. Okay, so without further ado, oh, I think we pretty much have our five words in the chat already. Let's see. Let me figure that one out. Yeah. Way more than five words there, so we'll have to take the first five. Lake, marvelous, bill, shrine, and preacher. So the five words for tonight's five word challenge are lake. Marvellous, Bill, Shrine, and Preacher. So you have 15 minutes to work wonders or write something terrible. That's also acceptable. <laughs> See you in 15 minutes.
that was 15 minutes guys so uh great to see so many heads down and working away um it was a very noisy silence and um, great okay so i i think i get a feeling that there's going to be quite a few five word poems um excuse me that was my little alarm there should have been on silent sorry um so you can for those of you that want to read your five word poems and take part in this little competition if you type your name into the chat and five words so five words and your name and when we have a list we will um, get the ball rolling and you can uh, take your turns to read your poems and it's very important that the people listening pay attention and uh, tune in to the poem that touches you the most or makes you laugh your favorite poem basically so that at the end we can um, figure out who gets to win the books. So there's a few people <coughs> typing their names in there. Paul's busy beside me writing them all down. And I guess it's important not to take it too seriously. So if you have written something and you're a bit on the fence about whether you should share it or not, generally it's best to share it. Better out than in. But um, of course, you could be the judge of that yourself. So the first person up is Finn Hale. Oh. Hall, sorry, pardon me, Finn Hall. Okay, give me a sec. Move it on one screen to the other and we'll be there. All right. Um, okay, I've actually entitled this Bill Lake, the Marvelous Shrine Preacher. You can build your shrine to your money, God. Freedom through death, however, is wrong and is odd. The preacher man preaches to save our souls, driving off in his flash car draped in gold, ignoring the pleas from the poor, the sick. The conflict of interest bothers him not as he boards his very own private yacht moored by the lake with marvelous views. 65-inch telly, 24-hour news, picking out only the one-sided reports. Little news from abroad, unless it's poor Brits. They voted for breakfast, now complain of the shit. The shit that has left them forced to go home. No stories of Syrians, Palestinians or more. Suffering and dying on faraway shores. Children and adults, their cries loud and shrill. Ignored by the politicians with wallets full of bills. The lies keep spreading, they watch for a gap and spread division among us. Watch out, it's a trap. Thank you so much, Finn Hall. Uh, it's a great start to this competition. And also just to say that the people watching on Facebook, you too can vote for your favorite five word poem. So listen carefully and when the time comes, we'll ask you to enter your favourite poet into the Facebook chat. Okay, so without further ado, our next poet up is Karen Warinsky. Okay, hi, that's going to be a tough one to follow, but I'll give it a shot. Okay. The bird called out, shrill and keen, its bill pointing north in the sharp spring air. A woman just getting out of her car, heard the cry, stopped still, didn't close the door, and leaned into the morning, looked at the shrine of a lake before her, and listened to this preacher telling the truth. It would be a marvelous day. That's it. <laughs> Excellent. Well done, Karen. And um, we keep moving now, so I think it's going to be pretty full. So next up, we have Owen Condon, please. Thank you. Down by that marvelous, marvelous lake, you can listen to the waters preach, or you can be the preacher and shout out, cast off those heavy bills, but words clot in my throat down there. Listen to that lake, that shrine. Maybe, maybe there are grounds for hope yet. That's it. Thank you, Owen. And now we'll have Jessica White, please. 
Hi. So this is called Silent Sermon. They build a shrine to him, one he designed himself, towering, proud. The statue with its arms outstretched embraces eternity from his plinth, patterned round with tea lights, offerings of flowers, incense, the ground littered with silent, unanswered prayers. Flames flicker back at him from the lake's reflection. His marvellous glory shines in the glint of a swan's bill, its wingspan, its dark and furious feathers. Echoes of his empty words cross the quiet water. The swan ascends, its wings creature to the lonely wind. Thanks. Lovely to Dr. Jessica, thank you. And now we'll have Ada Mills, please. Miles, rather. Oh, it's me already. <laughs> okay, this one is about those uh, receipts you get in the supermarkets with fortunes. Uh, fortune purchase. Out to the shrine to receive the bill. Marvelous fortunes printed under price. The preacher was tired. The rain left lakes. Receipt declares, don't rush for fuck's sake. That's it. Thank you, Ada. And now we will have Jill Monroe. Hi, everybody. It was a marvellous night. An open-air supper on the banks of Lake Garda. A table for two, a candle, a cloth, white napkins folded like shrines to the food set before us by Paolo, an elegant creature who glided towards us like a smooth waterfowl with feathers unruffled. All was just perfect until he presented his imperfect bill. Thank you, Jill. And Jill is one of our winners of the five word competition. So we'll be hearing more from her later. Looking forward to that. And um, next up, we will have Moira Stevens, please. The preacher called the shots. Do this, do that, thou shalt not. We swam in the lake, him and me, marvellously naked and free. They watched from the shores, but hidden. Minds like the farmer's foul midden. We laughed and we played, unafraid, in our naive, childish ways. But the preacher had heard, and his words ruled our world. We walked to the shrine, barefoot and bleeding, and all ignored our pleading. We knelt there, punished for being. Innocent of crimes, except in their minds. The preacher called the shots, but we paid the bill. Thank you, Moira. And now we will have Mary Ann Selling, please. Heron. He pins the lake to the landscape, cloaked like a preacher. The only discernible movement is the rippling, rippling reflection of his golden bill held out over the water's edge. How marvellous to watch him as finally he leans into the breeze, lays his soft rounded wings upon the undulating air, then slowly rises to meet the shrine of sticks in the distant trees that he calls his home. Thank you, Mary. We'll have Sarah Murphy, please. The lake, his lake, was marvellous in the early light. He was old, older than he dreamed he'd reach. And still he said his morning prayers like all the days. He had been a preacher and now he muttered the words by heart as he drank his tea, his mundane sacrament, and noted in passing a bush that he would later prune or begin to prune. Small steps were now the order of his days. The shrine at which he worshipped had changed, was greener, less gilded. 
His pulpit no longer a marble podium, his garden was where he worked now, butterflies and birds to whom he preached. Speaking of, he heard a splash, saw a heron plunge its shiny bill for a drink. He gulped his tea again in empathy, in communion. Thank you, Sarah. And next up, we will have Julie Field. Sentence poem. What a marvellous lake shrine, said Bill the preacher. <laughs> Short, but not so sweet, eh? <laughs> Thanks, Julie. And uh, just so you all know, Julie will be our guest poet next month. So uh, I know I'll be looking forward to that. So uh, nice one, Julie. Thank you. And next up, we have Lauren O'Donovan. Thank you very much. I won't be as succinct as a sentence, but it'll be pretty quick. I lunch by the lake, eating marvellous cheesecake with a base of crumbled cornflake topped with a swirl of lavender liqueur. I can't decide which to prefer, the cake or the previous steak, which dripped blood and gravy in the embrace of roast veg. Not being a connoisseur, I defer to my taste buds, which purr in pleasure while my belly aches for more space. By the time I call for the bill, my plate is a shrine to the skill of the chef, the preacher in this house of holy food. Or, I think with the chill, judging by my arteries thickening, maybe instead the chef is Lucifer and I am just a vessel of his will. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, can we have Derek Sedden, please? And it's um, another restaurant one. Thomas Cortis Restaurant, The Shrine, a temple of marvellous Irish cuisine. Fish fresh out of the lake you viewed from the windows, beef from the red cattle grazing in the backfield, vegan delicacies vibrant with local herbs. The waiters, dressed as preachers, served each course as if a sacred dish the chefs wore the white vestments of their trade unstained. And though at each meal's end it seemed a kind of blasphemy to think of money, no one doubted Thomas when he totted up the bill. Now in lockdown, the shrine is closed with shutters and the cast-out diners lament their tribulations. Remember when they were once so blessed with miracles of smell and taste. Thank you, Derek. And now we'll have Laura Thies. I hope I said that right. Thanks. <laughs> um, reading Shakespeare by the lakeside. I am alone today. That is, I'm not really alone. What I mean is, I've got the lake to myself, sharing only with a handful of dark feathered ducks that look like preachers with their white collars, their stretched out wings. And I've got a dog-eared copy of The Tempest, so in a way, I've got him too. Bill, as I call him affectionately. That marvellous dream weaver, whose legacy is enshrined in our language. Between him and the chatting ducks, I have all the company I need today. Thank you, Laura. And next up, can we have Colm Scully, please? Thanks, Rosie. Um, this is called Yosemite, and it's set in Yosemite in, in California, it's Yosemite National Park. These words brought me to a marvellous memory, to Mirror Lake in Easter 2010, hunting for stones on the pebbled shoreline, the surface echoing the pristine sky. When the girls were asleep in our log cabin, woken by woodpeckers hammering Bill, I strolled in the morning, through snow-crested redwoods, where nature's preacher, service and shrine, collected huge pine cones, watched in the stillness for the ghosts of Indians, the shadows of bears. 
bring back the bear, they say. It wouldn't be such a bad thing, apparently. And the wolves, you know. You know, we'd all be going walking for our, uh, our old pandemic walks in the forest would be a lot different then, wouldn't they? <laughs> but um, next up, can we have Catherine Ronan, please? Uh, I'm glad. To, I don't think this guy is in the company here, so I, I can feel free to, to recite this poem. I call it First Kiss. We bobbed up and down as teenagers in your father's rowing boat on the deepest lake in Trigumna. You wore marvellous grey Levi's and a white granddad shirt. Too afraid to tell you that I couldn't swim, afraid that I would not fit the bill. Oh, but your teeth were a shrine, your lips the holy grail, the seventh son of a seventh preacher, the fabulous promise of a first kiss far outweighed drowning in the afternoon. Sweet spoon. Sorry, we are at lessons now officially this year, so I can say stuff like that. Um, so next up, we'll have Cedric Bicond, please. So this one is titled Her. I can't forget her, but the memory written Sometimes when I try to remember, I see a lake with at the horizon an invitation to elope with her. Skip the whole thing, the wedding at a marvelous shrine nearby. Paddle hard, flip the bird to the preacher, paddle into the sunset, or maybe run into a field of sunflowers, eloping still. The price of our love is our family footing the bill. We love, uh, we love of the day until the sky darkens and the air has this chill running down my spine. I'm forgetting it. I pray to remember again with the next bill. I don't want to forget her. Uh. Thank you, Cedric. Um, next, can we please have Cahal? Hey guys, how you doing? Mine's a short one. The lakes is full of jade and silver, as the preachers full of peso bills, and it's those who've lost their marvels, who's just a shrine that's never filled. Thank you. Thank you, Cahal. And now we'll have Dan Johnson. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is called uh, The Possible. So many adjectives, nouns, things to be and be described. The lines of a poem specify the blankness of the page, the way it can be modified, denied, enhanced, defiled. Noun, lake, adjective, marvelous. What could anything be after all? A bill, space inked carved for law, the basis, the bars of prison cells latched, unlatched, monies allotted for the hungry child, or a sermon page, some preacher scribbling frantically in the Alabama heat, a bead of sweat falling to the paper signature. God, the blankness like a shrine, simple, endlessly complicated product from marking. I feel its terrain under the nib of my describing pen. Cheers. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Dan. And now, can we have Mags Creedon, please? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hear me, Rosie? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, this is fast and furious. Um, a battle cry, those who vent within their silent fortress spent. Voice to fight for you, eyes above the depth for you, who seeps the cruel and the vengeful, the poor and kind fools, lift off by moral judgments, sidestepped by the peer group, think, watched alone and act, seek that voice you're holding back, your dark lake, 
lift your eyes, straighten up your tired back and dive straight for the hidden coral, your shape of water, free of all in your aqua world. You seek the soul, jewel, rose, free of gravity, marvellous, glorious. The words are stolen, songbird chords are silent, choked, and the strain of oil, extreme unction, polluted of water colour pigment. The thing that cannot be cut off, the one last branch that's hanging off, sap of creativity climbs soft. A drink again for clinging, drying roots. No pulpit or no preacher will ever match your truth. Forgive the power of silent witness. One hope of freedom and peace for the torment. One wish, uh, sorry, one dream to wish lonely loveless. One wish of kindness to the darkness. That's it. Thank you, Mags. And now we'll have Emily Davis Fletcher, please. Thanks. Yeah, I hope my band was been going in and out, so hopefully you can hear me okay. All right. A preacher ordered a preacher ordered us to get out and see miracles in the everyday. A lake can be a shrine. A college campus can be a place to hear a lamb bleat at midnight. Did I say preacher? I meant teacher. How marvelous to be wrong. Another miracle. I have a date tonight, the first in four months. I'll ask him to swing dance. And if he says yes, then I'll know nothing is really lost, just different. A different Valentine's night, the one you and I danced under balloon hearts that kept a beat on the ceiling, their blind touching, places softer than their skin to break. I hope my date picks up the bill too, like you. <laughs> <laughs> but his hair is so black with potential, a night sky the balloons could soar through. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And that was a beautiful poem to, to round off a five-word poetry challenge, unless there is anybody else amongst you that wants to type their name in really quickly. Five, four, three, two, one. Augustina, but I will type it. Wow, that was right to the... Okay. Um, you, you're not able to re read it? Actually, I think I can. Is my volume okay? It's perfect, yeah. yeah perfect. Perfect. Um, obviously, I came late, so I'm like, oh, I want to write something. <laughs> <laughs> um, like a blind man swimming in a lake, Bill made marvellous circles. I remember speaking in tongues like a preacher at a shrine. Thank you. Excellent. I'm so glad you got that one in there. It was uh, yes. would have been a shame to keep it to yourself, Augustina. So thank you. And wow, it's great. Right on the one. So now everybody that was listening so carefully, now is your chance to pick your favourite poem. Now I know it's kind of crazy to be uh, putting a competition on something like poetry, but this is what we're doing. And um, I'm sure everybody has a favourite. It doesn't mean it's the best, but it means it's the best for you in this moment in time. So if you have a favourite, write their name and winner into the chat. And Paul will be scurrying to uh, <laughs> the winner out of all the, the names that you're going to um, type in. And on Facebook also, if you can do the same, write the winner's name and the winner after it into the Facebook chat. That'd be great. Thank you. Wow, it was really full. Was I like, let me see one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> like 15 or so will be participated. 21. 21. 
Do any of you try to figure out who it is yourselves by looking at the chat? It's not so easy. Emily, it's going good. I'm not allowed to vote. I was just about to vote, but I've been told I'm not allowed. It's great. From those moments where I wish I could play a nice little instrument, but I can't, and I won't sing because that would be worse. Facebook. I was just checking Facebook. All that is. We can always call this our minute silence for Prince Philip Rab if you like. Those of you that wish. Sure, why not? Facebook is just full of clapping hands. <coughs> Loads of them. So we have a tie. There's two winners tonight. And of course, it would be one of the people whose name I struggled to say, and I'm now having a brain block about whether yes, I get it yes. right the second time or not. So that means, yes, Laura Hess, you are one of our winners tonight, and also Sarah Murphy. So, oh, um, whether I get it right the second time or not. So that means, yes, Laura Hess, you are one of our winners tonight, and also Sarah Murphy. So, oh, um, and there you go. Oh, sorry about that. I think we had a bit of feedback there. <laughs> All I could do is hear myself. It was very strange. Okay. So, Sarah Murphy and Laura Tess, you are winners and you will receive Aidan Murphy's Wrong Side of Town and uh, this very new edition of the Five Words channel, um, Challenge Book. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, you each will have to read your poems again. So Laura, would you like to go first? Thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry about my surname. It's um, it's a German name, so it's Tice. Uh, <laughs> um, reading Shakespeare by the lakeside. I am alone today. That is, I am not really alone. What I mean is the lake to myself, sharing only with the handful of dark feathered ducks that look like preachers with their white collars, their stretched out wings. And I've got a dog-eared copy of The Tempest, so in a way I've got him too, Bill, as I call him affectionately, that marvellous dreamweaver whose legacy is enshrined in our language. 
Between him and the chatting ducks, I have all the company I need today. Excellent. Thank you so much, Laura, <laughs> and very, very well done. Um, so I think if you would like to put your um, address in. Oh, yeah. oh, Paul has it. Sorry, it's just grand. No worries about there. Um, so next we will have Sarah Murphy, please, if you would like to read your form. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's my first time coming along to this, so I'm delighted. Um, the preacher, the lake, his lake, was marvellous in the early light. He was old, older than he dreamed he'd reach, and still he said his morning prayers like all the days. He had been a preacher and now he muttered the words by heart as he drank his tea, his mundane sacrament, and noted in passing a bush that he would later prune or begin to prune. Small steps were now the order of his days. The shrine at which he worshipped had changed, was greener, less gilded, his pulpit no longer a marble podium. His garden was where he worked now, butterflies and birds to whom he preached. Speaking of, he heard a splash, saw a heron plunge its shiny bill for a drink. He gulped his tea again in empathy, in communion. I certainly hope you come again, Sarah. That was a great start. Um, excellent. So now the five word challenge is done for, uh, for this month. Um, so I just have a few announcements before we move on to the, the five word competition um, celebrations. Um, okay. Yeah, all right. So what we'll be celebrating the culmination of the eighth five word poetry international competition tonight means that we can now move on to the ninth five word international poetry competition and the opens tomorrow um the words for this week are ordinary april canvas word and blaze and it'll be open for entries from the 1st of May up until the 31st of August. And there is an audio archive also. There is an audio archive, um, HTTP, www.obail.ie. These are all popping up in the, in the chat there. Okay, now Obail aims to maintain a safe space for writers and the general public. So uh, the um, chat is open for everybody to use. We hope that you use it respectfully. And obviously if anybody is not using it respectfully and if you're receiving nasty little messages from anybody in this group, please let us know and we will be sure to block them in the future. Um, I'm sure that won't happen. It hasn't happened yet, so fingers crossed. We're all nice human beings. Um, the open mic will be available to revisit as an MP3 podcast um, on video. V, I think he's going to stick that up there as well. No. All right, I'll read that one. Video via vimeo.com uh, oval forward slash oval. Vimeo.com forward slash oval, just to be clear. And, but the reading itself is a once off tonight. Um, our guest poets on the 10th of May for our first bilingual event of 2021 will be our very own Judy Field, who is sitting there on her cozy couch um, with us tonight. And I'll be really looking forward to that. And she'll be joined by Duvon Olongon. I probably said that wrong, Duvon Olongon. Okay, hopefully he won't be out from my blood after that one. Anyway, they'll both be reading their debut collections from Kush King, so that's something to look forward to. And we'd like to thank everybody that has kindly donated. Um, our PayPal donations can be made via the link above the live poetry stage on our website. And um, yeah, and I suppose a, a, a sadder announcement, we'd like to extend our very deep sympathies to the family and friends of Jackie Shortland. Many of you would have met Jackie in person at our, when we actually had a, face-to-face -face ovales in the Long Valley. She was a lovely person um, and she always brought a sense of enthusiasm and a bit of crack when she took to the open mic and uh, she passed away recently and she will be missed. So 
Uh, I hope the poetry is flowing for her wherever she is now and that she's uh, doing better than she was in her last days here. Okay, um, that's for Jackie. So now, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over Maestro of Maestros himself, Mr. Paul Casey, and he will take you to the rest of the night. Wow. Thank you, Rosie, first of all. Um, for managing all that, I, I couldn't have juggled all those balls. All right, that's for sure. So thanks a million. Um, and thank you all for being here. Delighted with those five words challenge poems. It's a great start to the night. The, the real spirit of a veil is thriving and strong. Um, okay, so we're here at the, the main event part. I'll pass everything back onto Rosie a little bit later. I've got a few technical balls to juggle tonight. So Rosie will take, um, uh, take the reins back for the uh, open mic tonight. And just, uh, just to remind you all that the open mic isn't for your own poems tonight. It's for poetry by anyone else but yourself. It's just the only, the only time of year that we do that. So uh, this will give you a little time to, to find one in case you weren't aware of that. Okay, so um, we have, I'm not exactly sure ex uh, the exact list of who we have from the contributors so far, but we're basically going to first have our, our top three um, prize winners uh, read, um, and then we'll go on to the shortlist of poets. And after that, um, we will uh, listen to the writers of the specially selected lockdown poems, which were chosen from uh, all of the entries. Um, and after that, we will listen to contributors to the rest of the book um, with poems, reading poems that they've written for, for nights like this, for the five, at the Five Word Challenge during Avail live sessions. So we'll go in that order. <clears throat> so uh, it's, it's a longer night than usual. So I hope you, you buckle up and I hope you, if you want to run off to the fridge now might be your chance, I don't know. But um, really looking forward to, to everything that's on the way tonight. Um, I, I don't see, I see we have our lovely judge Grace Wells with us tonight as well. Hi Grace, and uh, Grace will be saying a few words in a little while. Um, but uh, first of all, I... Uh, so yeah, and I'm going to go in reverse order for, for the uh, for the for the three the three uh, prize winners. Um, so first of all, uh, I'm going to introduce Laura Tace, and she's going to read um, her winning poem and, and possibly another poem if she'd like to. She's welcome to read another poem as well. Um, so I'm just going to move on and, and introduce you, Laura, if you're ready. Um, uh, Laura grew up in Germany, moved to the UK uh, a decade ago and writes poems, stories and songs in her second language. Uh, she has uh, an MST, Distinction in Creative Writing from Oxford. Her debut poetry collection, How to Extricate Yourself, uh, Dempsey and Windle 2020 was selected as the winner of the 2020 Brian Dempsey Memorial Prize by the Poetry Society's Paul McGrain. Her work has been widely anthologized, appears in a variety of journals uh, from Strange Horizons to Emerslexia, and has been published in the UK, Ireland, Belgium, and numerous other countries. Um, she's an AM Heath Prize recipient. She won the Hammond House International Literary Award uh, for poetry. So we certainly have um, a worthy winner for our third place prize tonight and the 2020 Mogford Short Story Prize. She was highly commended for the 2020 Acumen Poetry Prize. Uh, there's a big long list that I certainly can't get through and she's uh, a finalist in over 20 other international literary competitions and we're delighted to hear from her tonight. And congratulations, Laura, on your, on your third place um, poem and we're looking forward to hearing that. Thank you so much. Um... So uh, my, should I say my words first? Oh, as you like, it's up to you, yeah. yeah. Okay, so the five words were um, speck, spill, lover, over, silver. And the poem is called, What you meant when you promised we'd go to the circus. The spotlight, 
is a pinprick of sun through the blinds. The lion is a calico kitten asleep on the windowsill. The trapeze is an empty bag slung over the back of the chair. The dancers are all specks of silvery dust. The sad clown is me, spilling half of my coffee onto my whitest dress because my hands are shaking. The magic trick is the lover performing a very arcane disappearing act. And that was my um, poem from the competition. And you just said I'm allowed another one. So I'm going to do a really quick plug for my book. So this is my um, poetry debut that came out just uh, in December, my, my first book. And there's a poem from it called Medusa. Do not lose faith on the day you wake up with spiders instead of hair. Do not cry as you look in the mirror. Remember. They may stay, they may not. They're here for now. If you must take pains to cover your head, hide their crawling under your most elegant hat, lest people recoil from you in the streets. Or don't. Remember Medusa and her snakes. She'd turn anyone to stone if they looked at her frightened. She was a monster and proud. All hiss, curse and scorn, danger. And yet to think, someone must have loved her enough to name half of all jellyfish, those moon glowing blooms of floating fluorescent umbrellas and bells after her. Thank you. <laughs> that was gorgeous. Thank you so much, Laura. Fantastic altogether. It's a brilliant start. Um, wow. Wow, okay. Um, so next we have uh, Jill Monroe. Jill Monroe has won our uh, second place this year. Jill, Jill is also um, a past winner of the competition, as Rosie mentioned before. We have a, a few alumni here tonight. We have the, uh, the Derek and Marianne Sellen combination of uh, power poetry uh, over there in that little box over there, I see. <coughs> they, they've not only both won, but Derek has actually won the competition twice. Um, so they they're almost enshrined in the in the, uh, the the five words you know forever um, row of competition winners, and um, so we're, we're thrilled to have all of those uh, writers with us. There are there are uh, poets here who have been shortlisted in previous competitions as well. Thrilled to have you all with us as well, and looking forward to your poems. Um, but next we have Jill, who won the second prize uh, in the competition, and I will just introduce her. Now she has been published in major poetry magazines, including Frogmore Press, the Popshot Quarterly, the Fenland Read, and the Rialto, and her work has been anthologized in the Emma Press, Candlestick Press, Paper Swans Press, and Calder Valley Press. Uh, she won, uh, as we've said, the Ovale Five Words International Poetry Competition 2017-2018. Um, her first collection, uh, Man from La Paz, was published in 2015 by Green Bottle Press. She won the Fair Acre Press pamphlet competition uh, in that year with the Quilted Multiverse, um, published the next year. Um, and Jill was awarded a Hawthorne and Fellowship for 2018 and lives and writes in the depths of Ashdown Forest. So please welcome Jill Munro. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, Great to be here, and uh, I couldn't make it the year I won because I had an eye operation, so it's really nice to be here now. Um, my, my poem, well, the five words are icon, warm, lodestar, bind, and tune. The Shoglization of Joan. To herald in autumn, she places drying chrysanthemums in clear glass, on the window ledge beneath Chagall's church staining of pastoral spring, oblivious to her obscuring of his iconic mule, not seeing golden light, lodestar bright, fall on the hops and empty poppy heads arranged last week, until quiet steps of brogues on flagstones change the ringing clop of hooves. Joan feels a gentle current's lift, 
A happy floating begins to unbind her as she rides the deep red horse elevating from the vestry floor. She hears a distant scrape of violin strings in the bow dancing of a goatly tune and swims in indigo, turquoise seas, caught in a non-drowning tempest, unfolds vivid wings and flies to Christ's right shoulder. A butterfly, an angel, she does not care, just wants the purple violet rise of air, a harp to pluck, a flute to play, to be part of this glassy patchwork, to be a wash in a multicoloured quilt. Joan has captured the husks of nature in a vase. Now she's the warm yellow of an oak leaf that's opened, lived, then fallen. That's it. <laughs> I'll just do the one. <laughs> I think I might have another one in the um, other bit. The... Um, okay, uh, if, unless if you're sure, Jill, you can read the other one, but you can also read another poem now, if you like, as well, if you have uh, another one. It's you okay, I'll, I'll read in the, 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 the lockdown one as well, because it's quite okay. long, that one. <laughs> okay. okay. Great, thank you, Jill, well done, that was lovely. Um, I really enjoyed that poem. Actually, the the, um, the comments by Grace Wells on, on all of the shortest of poems are also published in the book. Once again, if you don't have a book, um, it's available as... Um, has a, a PDF online which you can which you can access. The link is on the the five word page on our website as well as on our Facebook page. Uh, and if or if you're stuck for the link, just give us a shout and we'll send it your way. Um, but it's wonderful to read through the through the judges' comments. Um, um, tremendous insight into the poems. And um, so actually, before I before I uh, introduce our winning poet. I think this would be a good time um, to ask uh, Grace Wells, if she doesn't mind, uh, if she's ready to, to maybe say a few words. All right, Grace. Thanks, Paul. Thanks so much. It's really, really special to be here. It's so lovely for me to connect faces and characters with these poems that I've been living with for a really long time. And um, I'm really proud to be part of this project because when I hold this book in my hands, I can see it's so much more than my small part in this evening's proceedings. It's really just an, an epic book. Um, and I'm proud to be part of tonight's community of writers because I think above all, that's what Ovale is and that's what it's been for many, many years. This amazing community of writers that really understands the nature of support. And as writers, we need a lot of support and personally, I struggle with the idea of competition as support because I think it can set us against each other, whereas we need a kind of peer group where we respect this sort of feeling of mutuality and shared endeavor and common purpose of the written word, the art of writing, the search for meaning memorialization or creative expression, whatever we are up to, um, it's a much sweeter experience when our peers have our back and we're in a community. So I really celebrate Avail and how it has been that community for all of these years. And it's so, I'm really proud to have had a connection with Avail through those years, through that long decade and a bit more into the next decade. So, I was also delighted that Paul uh, went with the idea of having the uh, lockdown poems as well. Um, I'm going to read the, the judge's comment that I made for Sinead's uh, poem because it kind of explains a little bit about my process. But part of what I'm about to say is that there were so many poems that were really good and it was an almost impossible task to let those poems go. And I because I'm quite an empathetic person. I know I know how painful it is when a work isn't selected. I think this is why I'm in competitions. Um, and, and so every time I put aside a poem, I, I didn't do it lightly because I knew, I knew it was going to hurt uh, somebody somewhere. And I don't think that's what we should be doing. I think we need to encourage, encourage, encourage. Um, but by being able to have the lockdown poems in as well, I could keep some of my favorites for that little bit longer. So that was a delight for me. So I will just introduce um, 
this year's winning poem, A Rook Longs for a Badger by Sinead McClure. From the nearly 800 entries, I created a long list of about 100 poems, all fine pieces, all submitted within a week of their crafting. I wanted poems which gave no hint of their genesis, no glimmer of the short time frame they were conceived in, or of the five words that prompted them. Poems that really were poetry. About 50 entries fitted that description. They all deserved to be shortlisted. Many could have won. But I chose A Rook Longs for a Badger because the poem so neatly, so lyrically addresses my politics. They are the only politics I believe we need to be exploring now. It is ever shocking to me how human-centric we are, how little nature exists in our collective thinking, even the thinking of poets. For years, she's been a sideline in the competitions I've judged. So few writers have given her even a glimmer of regard. Here's a poet who isn't just writing about nature, she's thinking as the creatures do. This type of thinking is the moral task of our times, but we won't get there by being lectured. We need to be seduced. How beautifully a rook longs for a badger calls, come hither. So thank you all so much. And thank you to Paul and to Rosie for giving me the opportunity to judge these amazing poems. Thank you, Grace. <clears throat> We're thrilled that you could be with us tonight and um, for your lovely words, your brilliant job. Uh, just such a stunning selection of poetry. Um, you know, from 775 entries, I think it was, 35 different countries. And I know you were thrilled to discover that uh, Sinead was the winner. Of course, you had no idea because all the poems were numbered when they were sent to you. <clears throat> um, so Sinead, I, I hope you're, you're, uh, you're almost ready to go. Um, I'm just about to introduce you. If you'd like to read two or three extra poems, you're welcome to as our winner. Um, so um, I see you nodding away there. I, I won't waste any more time. Sinead McClure, our five words, our eighth five words international poetry competition winner. Um, who behind her, I must say, has got the, the prize from Michael Ray. Michael usually can join us uh, on these nights, but tonight he just couldn't make it. Absolutely incredible glass artist. Uh, you should check out his work online. Um, President Higgins keeps um, buying stuff from him to, to, to gift to people overseas and what have you. Um, absolutely brilliant poet as well. So well worth looking at Michael Ray. Hi, Michael, if you're listening to us on Facebook. Um, Anyway, I've detracted. Sinead, back to you. <laughs> Sinead <clears throat> McClure is a writer, a radio producer, and illustrator. Her poetry has been published in Poet Head, Live Encounters, uh, Poetry and Writing, uh, Crossways Literary Journal, The Cabinet of Heed, Dodging the Rain, Step Away Magazine, and The Ekphrastic Review. Sinead has also written 15 dramas for the National Radio Children's Service, RTE Junior Radio, on the themes of conservation and Ireland's natural heritage. She often revisits these themes in her work and has a particular interest in wildlife conservation, uh, as Grace mentioned. Um, in December 2020, Sinead received a Professional Development Award from the Arts Council of Ireland to fund mentoring and research towards building her first poetry collection. And Sinead lives now in rural County Sligo, uh, with her husband and their two border colleagues. So please give a warm welcome to Sinead McClure. Thanks everybody. Hope you can hear me. I hope my internet from the wilds of Sligo is holding up for tonight. Um, thanks so much Paul and Rosie for this evening and to, to Grace Wells, um, what you said, um, it's the only politics for me as well. And um, it, it just meant an awful lot. I, also um, how you got the poems. To, to be shortlisted is amazing. To be shortlisted twice is just unreal. And uh, to win overall, uh, yeah, uh, more so. 
So I, I am going to read a little bit before I read the two five word challenge poems. And the first poem I'm going to read, uh, to the, this one I chose to read tonight because at the moment the swans are migrating back to Scandinavia and we live on the flight path and we often see them going over and we saw them this morning. So I immediately thought I'm going to read this poem tonight. It was first published in Live Encounters Poetry and Writing last year. And this is called Equinox and the Hooper Swans. First, it is the sound of children laughing, then hoots, howls and bellows above the tree line. This is the whoop of spring's arrival. Forty in one group arrow the sky, narrowly missing the tops of the Scots pine. Each day, more leave, climb higher, fly faster. They are leaving the lakes, leaving Gara, Key and Gill. When a pair leave late, tell them hurry up, and they will. Until the day casts shadows on their wings and they raise their voices once more, fly towards a mid-September sunset to return. Finally, it is the sound of children crying. The, uh, the next poem I'd like to read for you was published in Poet Head and uh, I suppose it's about the absurdity of modernity in a, in a rural setting. Uh, this is called Space Taxi. Soon I'll be able to hail an Uber to Mars. Well, not hail exactly. I will inform my driver I'm waiting on the corner at Kilty Tyke beside the tall green house. I'll be there early before the postman does his rounds, watching the heron fly over and the grey wagtail dance in the river. Then Uber can deliver me to the launch pad just off the bog road in Boyle, as good a place as any, well known for its UFOs. By then we'll all be flying everywhere anyway. One more lift off will hardly be noticed. Maybe someone out footing turf will remark on the plumes of smoke coughing across the fields towards them. Wonder why the slows have fallen off the blackthorn or the fallow deer are galloping their way. But they'll get used to the daily flights and laugh like the rest of us at the irony of no bus route to boil but a shuttle to Mars. When I'm strapped in, sucking my Simpkins travel sweets, hurtling towards the blue sky, Mrs. Higgins will lean across and ask, why are the windows so small or do you think there'll be tea? And I will smile and nod and grit my teeth as the capsule separates with one neat shudder and outside cuts from blue to nothingness with stars. Soon there'll be queues on the bog road to boil for the SpaceX Express to Mars and the English couple in Clunlu will sell their farm fresh eggs and raw honey. Mrs. Tansy from Breeshla will tout her box tea and young Welsh will sp sell space rock with Nocatelli running through it in red sugar leading. By then, I'll have forgotten all about my trip to Mars and my re-entry with a splash at the mouth of the Garavogue and waiting in the northwest rain for the train to Ballymote because I couldn't get a bus from Sligo back to the corner in Kilty Tig when I could get an Uber to Mars. I'm going to, to finish up with the, the two five word challenge poems. And thanks for indulging me for them too. Um, the, as I said, uh, Grace really got what I was saying, particularly in, in this poem. Um, the were five words were strange, word, breed, triangle and skin. And this poem is called Held Back. You spoke in strange patterns, a jigsaw of words with round edges. I could hear your chime echo through the school hall, a tin triangle resonant and rising above the adolescent hum. Some would mock your odd vernacular, sidestep your spittle to ape your strange gait. But you were one of us and we always put those who thought otherwise straight. It's almost 40 years. I can still see you. Nothing pales. 
swaying beside me on those twisting feet, vowels held midair, the clearest laugh of all. And uh, the final poem I'm, I will read is, is the poem that Grace chose to win this competition. It's a wonderful competition and this is a, a wonderful anthology and it's such an honour to be included among such great poets in this. Um, the one thing I'll say, I, I've, I've been writing about nature for years and um, I always try to notice it. I think that's important. I think if you notice nature, you'll notice if there's something wrong, you'll notice if there's something missing. And also I found that things impact other things. So if a, if a piece of habitat is damaged for some reason, it will have a detrimental effect on somebody else. And this is where this poem came for me and the five words that sparked it were wheel, cold, knit, snow and grass. A rook longs for a badger. Where did the badgers go? We miss their cuts. The cold wheels rut in snow, the nosed sized pockets knit these fields for years. Now we must peck deeper for our worms through new wet grass, frosted in ice, our feathers licorice black in the slick soft Irish winter. Rook calls, don't cull, all should be full for nature to persevere. Cull and fall towards a constant winter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sinead. Absolutely fun, fantastic work. And, um, you know, a really worthy winner of our, of our competition. We're delighted that uh, Grace chose you. And, but as she herself said, there were, there were 50 poems that would have made the shortlist. And it, it does become, you know, such a personal thing at that, um, at that stage. But certainly, you know, uh, I think there's many among us who would have chosen your poem as the winner tonight. So congratulations to that. And my apologies for neglecting to mention, of course, that you had a second poem shortlisted, um, which is the, the one you read first. Um, you're one of, uh, of three people to have two poems shortlisted uh, this year. Um, the second is with us tonight, Jane Sammons, and we'll be hearing from Jane quite shortly, and also Tamara Miles. Um, who has been shortlisted many times over the years uh, uh, during the life of, uh, of Vale's competition uh, and also come in sort of highly commended and what have you. Thank you for being with us too, Tamara. Um, so I'm, go I'm going to move on to the other shortlisted poets that we have first, and then we'll go on to the, the, the poems from the lockdown se section. So I, I, I see I have Jane, I've got Owen Condon with us as well. Hi, Owen, and Tamara Miles. So these are the, the, the three uh, other poets that I have shortlisted. I don't think I've missed anyone else out from the shortlist. I can see Mr. Evans waiting. That's David Evans waiting for me. I, I saw M and D Smith Evans. You really confused me with that one, David, but I know who you are. I'm glad you're with us and I'm glad I, I caught you uh, waving at us there. Um, okay, super. So that's, that's four other poets from, from the shortlist. Um, so it, it's almost a, a full contingent. Only two people I think couldn't make it. So we're going to go uh, first, we're gonna go in the order of Jane, Owen, Tamara, and then David. I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, so. Um, Jane, whenever you're ready, we'd love to, to hear your poems and congratulations on being shortlisted. Thanks, Paul, um, and thank you for inviting me to read. It's a great pleasure. And can I just say congratulations to the winners? I thought your poems were absolutely gorgeous. Um, so I stumbled across the competition just by accident, really, um, for the first time last spring, just at the beginning of lockdown. And I found it a great challenge. And something that kept me really busy and occupied during that difficult time. But I actually did set myself another challenge. I entered over several weeks, and that was to create some um, handmade collage art to accompany the poems that I wrote. So if you don't mind, I, I'll show you the collages that I made in the same week that, um, with the two poems that I was thrilled to have shortlisted. The first poem I'll read for you is called Girl Missing, and this is the collage. I don't know if you can see that okay. 
Um, this is the collage I made to go with it. This is a very dark poem inspired by um, the media coverage of some quite famous cases of child abduction. The five words were dandelion, rough, rain, antidote and skill. Girl missing. They found nothing in the allotment shed bar a whiff of stale fags and paraffin, a stash of rain-soaked smutty mags. They scoured the rough patch of land beyond the flats with sniffer dogs, dredged the pond, tied pink guilty ribbons to lampposts, lit altar candles and prayed. They said to vanish without trace was out of character. With flim-flam skill, they shammed a pledge on TV, cried soft cousining tears, an antidote to shame. In the clover field, behind the school, swallowtails and red peacocks flutter. Their secrets float away on the breeze like dandelion clocks. Um, and the second poem I was lucky enough to have shortlisted was called um, In His Jacket Pocket. And here is the collage I made to go along with this poem. The five words here were um, level, lace, fire, text and matter. In his jacket pocket. A packet of Marlboro Reds. Kleenex extra large. Three tree ball mints extra strong, betting slips, a deck of cards, Swiss army knife complete with corkscrew and spear point blade, a number scrawled on a post-it note, photograph of a busty blonde with handspan waist cinched in denim and lace, mobile phone, a wedding ring, confused regret at that foolish text, that sordid matter, Eurostar tickets to Paris unused, maxed out credit card, a key, a small space for his boyhood dreams, Route 66, Cadillac, the next alley, fire in his belly, a lighter, a hole through which his level head and dignity have slipped. Thank you very much. Superb. Thank you so much, Jane. Those are absolutely excellent poems. Thank you so much indeed for letting someone else in. And we'll move on, uh, if you're ready, to Owen Condon. Congratulations, Owen, on your shortlisted poem. Much, and thanks to Grace as well. The poem is called Crossing. Uh, my five words were precipice, loud, red, night, and oxygen. Crossing cast off their precipice into the water. Away from themselves, not worthy. Those who did not do it right stuck on embankments of muck. Look, I suppose it was hard to see at night. I remember often in the early hours. After my shift, stopped at the red light before crossing, looking at flowers fastened tightly to railings with a clip. Loud memories preventing sleep. Thank you. Couldn't hear you. I know. Thank you. Thank you, Owen. Um, we we had some difficulty with the sound there. You were kind of coming and going for some crazy reason. So we only got small snippets of the poem. Um, Better. Um. um it could be. Could you want to read a line for me? Second. Bridge crossing and river rescue. Can you hear that fine? Yeah, we can hear that fine. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to give it a go again? I'll give it a go again, yeah. All right. Uh, crossing is the name of the bone. There, I remember. Bridge crossing and river rescue. It was cast off their precipice into the water. Remember, friends pushing life preservers askew, away from themselves, not worthy, wasting oxygen. Yeah, I'm sorry, Owen. I'm going to have to cut you Again. off there. 
Sorry, mate. Yeah. I, I, I'll tell you what. Um, we'll Maybe the, you can fix whatever is going on with your audio. We can come back to you in a while, a bit later. And if uh, we don't get it right by the end of this section, you, somebody else can read it for you, perhaps. Um, so I don't know if there's anything you can do, maybe you know, in terms of microphones or headsets or any alternative uh, possibilities, or maybe log in on your phone via the Zoom app, do it that way, and we'll let you in that way. But um, sorry, you just completely, you know, we lost you completely. So, you know, we didn't want to hurt the poem any more uh, than, than it was. So, so we'll definitely come back to you, okay? All right, sorry, Owen. Okay, so, um, We'll move on for now. And if you are ready, Tamara, we'd love to hear from you. Congratulations once again. Thank you. It's great to see you, Paul. And I just want to say that I uh, opened the PDF. It's the first time I've seen the document. And Grace, your comments made me, um, my throat get tight and tears in the eyes and all. I really appreciate it. It's nice to be understood. So the first poem is um, Both Ends. And the words are tunnel, sky, virtual, heartbeat, and black. It is as if you are in a tunnel, grandmother. And I must crawl through rat and ruin to find you in the black. We are about to be born. Then it will be necessary to introduce myself. Lady, I am daughter to the cradle boy who cried for you while he waited for new parents. You never really knew either of us, but now I visit your last apartment in the virtual world. Boren Street, Seattle, on Pill Hill. How did you go so far from home? How did you die? Lady, I will speak to you like the ghost of Hamlet's father. You hold the sky with all its answers. I am closer now. I hear your heartbeat, quick and anxious as my father's in his crib. Thank you. Uh, this is called Elts, and the words are flare, zoom, fox, cloud, and edge. Elts. 25 years ago, today, my baby of 21 weeks in the womb rose to the edge of else on a cloud. A flare of grief in the holding, how she looked like my other daughter, only mute and still as a nurse's face. No one knows what to say as we zoom into our shared losses marked by that little creature of the gods who slipped honest from my arms like a fox to her own wild woods. Thank you everybody for letting me participate again. And great to see you Marianne um, and Derek also. Thank you Tamara. Thank you. Congratulations, that was great. Okay, um, so the the last uh, in our shortlist section tonight, we have David W. Evans with us. Hi, David. Welcome and congratulations. Thank you very much. It's a, an honor and a real pleasure to be uh, included and with you again. Um, I, I, I was tempted to give a lecture on art history, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, but I will point out that uh, light fastness, in case you don't know it, is a measure of pigmentation and how long it lasts, its durability. Um, the poem is about Turner and originally it was about principally the idea of patronage and whether the artist outlives the, uh, the, the, the in this case, the Earl of Egremont. Um, so with that little preamble aside, I shall crack on. The five words were curl, east, heron, bloom, oblique, light fastness. Mr. Turner sees the lights, remembers where, what day it was, dusk or dawn, it matters not. A curl you call 
is caught beneath this sketched out memory of heat. He fetches up King's custard on his brush. The sun blooms, clouds catch fire. Mr. Turner steps away, he's seeking snuff. The oarsmen splash, the business of insects, the banks flowerless. It's all here, like it never was. An extra guinea would have got the Earl a majestic bird, a heron here, close to the willow, or maybe, maybe one in flight, shifted by a wickering horse. Flash of grey, stripe of white, black plume oblique as a tar's pigtail. Mr. Turner tilts the world to suit his eye, flipping east for south, heads or tails. Turning round the sky, he bids the sun rest and rise, wheresoever he may please. The earl can shift the earth, release the sea to flood a trough of land, rubbing salt in the scar of his new canal. The aristocrat has his bank, Mr. Turner has his brush. Comes down to this, always did. Them's who make and them's what buy. Mr. Turner is Mr. Booth in reclusive moods. And in reclusive moods, he rose mid Thames until then what wants him's gone. And when he's good and gone, what then? There'll always be an Earl of Egremont. They number him now to tell him apart. This current one's number three. And number three, the world will always know. The future's common tongue will recall George Wyndham, patron of the modern art. And Mr. Turner? Like Lake Red, a green, and a geranium shade, he was great in his day when freshly applied. And oh, the sunlight, the storm and rain, luminous fog and the power of sea. All's made to fade. Even great Claude will flake and fail. And while he'd wager heaven's not destined to harbour them both, they're bound to meet betimes, strolling the columns of a dead earl's catalogue. Mr. Turner feels a chill, thoughts of death and failing Claude. He throws a log upon the grate, pinches snuff, and watches with a painter's eye. The 18th century give way to steam, then smelder into burn. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, David, and great to see you, and congratulations once again. Um, I think, uh, Owen, I, I know you've logged back in there. I'm not sure where you, I can't see you right now. Are you, st are you back with us? You, you came back and then disappeared again. Okay, that's possibly what happened. Um, okay, so we will move on to the lockdown poem section, uh, which is a special selection that, um, that, that Grace, that sort of, you know, the, you know a very, very strong poems, um, you know, uh, about uh, our about our times um, that stood out for Grace and she thought that they they deserved a place and um, I agreed with her and uh, delighted that we could do that uh, for this year's edition. Um, and there were 10 separate uh, poems that uh, were chosen eventually, or was it 11? I think 10. Um, 10, yeah, of which we have seven of the writers, one of whom also has a poem shortlisted, Jill Monroe. Uh, so congratulations, Jill. Um, so the the order will probably go in, and I'm going to say all the names just in case there's someone here once again who I have not seen. Uh, Paul Cahill, welcome, Paul. Uh, Lucy Holm, uh, Jill Monroe, Jessica White, Rose Rosemary Norman, Sarah Murphy, and Alicia Sometimes. Sarah, of course, being one of our co five word challenge winners tonight. So there's a cross over there. So um, if there's anyone else, please let us know. Uh, we're looking really forward to this selection of poems. And thank you, Grace, for, um, for suggesting that. This really has given us an extra dimension um, to, um, to make this an even more exciting event than it is. So please, first, uh, uh, could we welcome, if you're ready, please, Paul Cahill. Sorry, hello, can you hear me? 
Um, and I just want to say it's a pleasure to hear all your poetry tonight. It's a, it's a real pleasure, um, and thank you for listening to mine. Um, my words were steep, swift, essence, single, and crest, and the poem is called uh, Plus Ça Change. We travelled to Saigon on honeymoon in 2016. The shock of the city grated with the quiet peace of Siem Reap. And the people there wore masks, face masks, like in the hospitals at home or on the telly, walking the streets with Doctor Who designs and Hello Kitty, fashion accessories. It's mad, we thought, back then, on honeymoon. Our curve was steep and swift and flattened, a tidal wave without a crest. Good people politely acquiesce, face coverings muffling our essence. You're all single now, behind the masks, between the beats. The honeymoon is ended. Having said all that, it's funny how we recognise casual acquaintances by looking at their smiling eyes, we still can see our indomitable humanity. Thank you. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you, Paul, and congratulations. And uh, next, could we please have Lucy Holm? There, Lucy? Also a previous shortlisted... Uh, uh, Fibro Challenge, co fibro challenge competition. Can anyone hear me? Or... Yes. 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 Um, thanks, everybody. It's brilliant to be here and to hear everybody's poems. They're fan absolutely fantastic. So thank you. And um, thanks to Grace and everybody. So my poem, the words were fibre, poem, ginger, apart, and blind. And my poem's called One Task a Day. Begin German lessons or Latin, something you don't need. Spruce kitchen cupboards. Eject skeletons from the closet. Eat more fibre, fewer carbs, and juice your rotting spinach to eliminate needless waste. Write a story based on the contents of your fridge. Rewrite, rewrite an old poem about your pet, pet's blank faces from a fresh angle. Think daily of your goals, how you can realise them when all of this is over. Speak at night to your demons, sense their joy now they have you to themselves. Learn to pronounce new words for use at parties you won't attend. Set out to marry Kondo, end up deep in the mating rituals of woodlice and of squid. Loathe yourself, your stupid list, your petty discomforts, the constant compulsion to succeed on paper and in the opinions of others. Clean home, clean eating, clean teeth, a clean sheet. Once life resumes and you rise from the dust, ego and intact, when all of this is over. You sign petitions to bring murderous cops to justice, but keep scrolling in pursuit of your objectives as the world falls apart. Consider it a luxury to be colorblind when you are white, but still, you must get summer body ready and on the list for online VIP events, where people sit on virtual panels and eyes can't meet. Create a smaller version of your former existence in situ. Complete all tasks on this exhaustive, exhausting agenda to read back aloud with satisfaction when all of this is over. Thanks. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. And um, we're now going to hear from uh, Jill Monroe who is also the second place winner of the competition. Jill? Thanks again. <laughs> um, I apologize for the fact this is a Sestina. I had written one once before and someone said, never do it again. So <laughs> but I uh, ignored that. So here it is. Um, my five words were capsule, wind, mix, season and bloom. And I added my own one, which was bubble, to make the um, six end words. So, bubble sestina. We are now allowed a lifeline, a capsule. We can meet, granny, baby, relax, begin to unwind, 
with people who weren't allowed to be in our mix, in a time when we lost one whole season, when the bluebells were in bloom, when mashed brains were locked inside a bubble, a time when anxiety began to bubble over, when our homes became extraordinary capsules, when we peered out at inscrutable gardens, attempting to bloom, after months of rain, storms, wind, when we lost hours, days, weeks, April, May, seasons, when there were no meetups, no hope to mix, when strong plain flour and water were all we'd mix, then we wait for yeast to ferment and bubble, with a bit of sugar and salt to season, locked in our bread baking capsules, when freshly risen crusty loaves gave us wind, caused colour to cross wan cheeks, make them bloom. We quaffed pink rosés in full bloom, another gin and tonic would be mixed, and at bedtime we would wobble, wind our way up to bed, rest in a warm juve bubble, like weightless astronauts in their tinny capsule, circling as they watched Earth's change of season. But the world continues to turn, we cannot halt seasons, and there will again be roses, they will bloom, flowers will emerge, buds from green capsules, petals of pink, of peach, orange, a floribunda mix, a riot of colour, a fragrant joyous bubble, even when battered by early summer's wind. And are there any answers blowing in this wind? Is there any rhyme or reason to this June season when we're unlocked, released to form a bubble, rekindle friendships, allow love to bloom, mingle, socialise, rave, kiss, cuddle, mix again, choose one single special other capsule. Don't let it burst, this bubble. Let no second ill wind blow. Let our time capsule last. Let's always remember when we couldn't mix, hug. That dreadful season when a single touch did not dare to bloom. That's it. Sorry it was so long. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Jill. Um, I, I know that if Matthew Sweeney was still with us, um, you know, and he was the, the master of Sestinas, he's the only person I know who's published a complete collection of Sestinas, you know. Um, <laughs> He, he was a very proud Sistinier and he would hoist his, you know, his sword uh, at, uh, at sonneteers all the time. And he would, he would scold you for apologizing for your Sistina. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so, Thank you. Thank you. Too. Okay. So next, if you're ready, we'd love to hear from Jessica White. Are you here, Jessica? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can. Hi. Congratulations. Hi. Lovely, thank you. I'm very privileged to be included alongside all these wonderful poems. It's been a brilliant evening so far, thank you. Um, so my five words were dandelion, rough, rain, antidote and skill. And the poem's called Aftershock. During our weekly doorstep ritual, my nephew tapes a dandelion to a cocktail stick, posts it through the window slit. I press my face to glass cut out the glare to catch a glimpse of my newborn niece. Driving home past verges left uncut, which burst with rough beauty, the May sun flares too bright in a flightless sky. In the absence of aeroplanes and rain, seedlings gasp in dusty beds, the dandelion dies in the night. While we learn new skills, French knitting, basic Mandarin, piano scales, how to use a sourdough starter, how to lose control, adapt to the lack of human touch. Laboratories bustle behind glass, watch the world change in a microscope lens, pipette fear into petri dishes. We wait and wonder if they'll discover an antidote for loneliness. Each waking brings another aftershock. We count the days in dandelion clocks. Thank you. Superb. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thanks for that. Um, okay. And I think next we have uh, actually somebody who has been shortlisted in our poetry film competition before, um, which, which uh, our, our next of which kicks off on the 1st of May. You can 
if you're interested in poetry films. And uh, we're delighted to have her with us tonight, um, Rosemary Norman. If you're ready, Rosemary. Uh, I think you're still muted there. We, we can't hear you. There we go. I, hello, yes, right, I'm with you now. Um, this, I, I, I'm intrigued by the way that the five words don't, they, every time you get five words, they operate in a different way to get you going. And this one had got, uh, had the, it, the, the five words were sharp, touch, curve, dance and map. And the dance and map coming together gave me a word for something very familiar that I didn't have a word for before, which is my partner's unique way of using public transport, which of course he can't do at the moment. Um, so the, um, so we've all heard of tap dancing and lap dancing, but this is map dancing. It's called Till Further Notice. Till further notice, there will be no map dancing on buses. That game you play of won't wait. On the first one along, never mind the number, but if it fills over much or hits a touch of traffic, off. Repeat, i.e. walk most of the way. There will be no map dancing on buses, empty for all but necessary travel. Why would you, even if not forbidden, since they run on time? Map dancing is over now, at least until the curve of new infection flattens. Go if you must, but look sharp. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Rosemary. And uh, next, if you're ready, we'd love to hear from Sarah Murphy, uh, one of our Five Word Challenge winners tonight. Uh, Sarah? Thank you. Um, my five words were invent, lens, spring, wild, and refrain. And my poem's called This Morning. The air this morning was different Though my routine was the same, a school day, making porridge, brushing hair, the air was new and smelled of spring, as if the world was in flow, had invented a new lens with which to behold things, had reset somehow, gotten over itself and was lighter, had switched off the news telling it loudly of its decline and was listening to music instead. And we danced while loading the dishwasher, our small wild refrain to this new type of day. That was lovely. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks so much. And next um, we have Alicia Sometimes. Hi, Alicia. Hello. So lovely to be here. And I'm just so blown away by the quality of what everyone's reading. So I'm very excited. Um, my words were afterlife, room, trick, invert, and blackbird. And this is called Bird Calls. We're keeping an invisible chart, delineating the days between every face-to-face -face conversation. We begin to get creative in confinement, turn ourselves into maple origami, fashion hammocks out of blankets, craft vessels from old vinyl, shape bread into words, invert every room. We are undergoing lasting transformations. It's impossible to listen to Charles Mingus when standing still. You just want to scoop yourself up and parachute from on top of the house as sonorous notes chase you, free-falling. Each breath outside becomes triumphant, anything to nurture the fierce yearning, the longing for touch, even predictability. We reach out and deliver daisies and cake envelopes with red wine pencil marks, trick cards with faces. We stretch our ears into the afternoon sun, listening to the blackbird. They sing in sparkling paragraphs, no thoughts of yesterdays or tomorrows and in our, any afterlife. But we do, 
always carrying this extended memory with us, constructing our own symphonies of everyone's shared experiences, united tapestry of single notes. Thanks so much, Alicia. <coughs> Alicia, sorry. Are, are you uh, coming to us from down under? You are. It's Tuesday morning where you are? That's right. It's 7.30 in the morning and I have my cup of tea and my Jack Russell's begging to get fed. So, <laughs> Fair play to you. Well done for joining us. Thank you so much, really. Um, it, it, it feels almost as if you've spent the airfare to come here. It's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great that there's opportunities like this. So, so good to be here. All right. Super. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, all right. I think, <clears throat> fun, funny as it is, right now, um, an eighth uh, lockdown poem author is has just decided to try and join us, is struggling to connect to audio, but will possibly do shortly. Um, that's Brenda Wellborn, which, uh, whom we may hear from very shortly. Um, but just prior to that, I think that I don't think that Owen is going to um, to make it back. Um, so Rosie has volunteered to read Owen Condon's poem, uh, the shortlisted poem, uh, which she'll do for you now. It's, it's unfortunate he, he couldn't be heard reading it himself, so I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to do it justice. Um, so the five words were precipice, loud, red, night and oxygen. Crossing by Owen Condon. Back there, I remember the bridge crossing and river rescue. Young lives cast off their precipice into the water. I remember friends pushing life preserves askew away from themselves, not worthy, wasting oxygen. Back there, those who did not do it right stuck on embankments of muck, encompassed by shame and embarrassment. No luck. I suppose it was hard to see at night. I remember often in the early hours, after my shift, stopped at the red light, before crossing, looking at flowers, fastened tightly to railings with a clip. Loud memories, preventing sleep. Thank you, Rosie. And uh, thank you, Owen. If you somehow are listening to us via Facebook now, um, just re-looking at Owen's um, biography here, uh, he's got a very good excuse because he's living between the McGillicuddy Reeks and the Slea of Mish Mountains in County Kerry. So <laughs> I'm really not surprised that he is struggling with um, with his broadband. So um, thanks, Rosie, and congratulations once again, Owen. I just want to check, um, Brenda, are you with us? I, I see you've managed to connect, uh, Brenda Wellborn. If you are, uh, this would be a great time to hear your lockdown poem, because we're literally just coming to the end of that section of lockdown poems. Um, are you there, Brenda? No, um, maybe you're struggling a bit. Maybe um, if you do manage to connect in a while with your audio and video, we can, uh, we'd love to hear you read your poem. Thank you. Uh, I can, hear you now. can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Hi, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so sorry I can't get the um, the the video working here, but um, I do have my poem. I'll be glad to share it. We would love to hear it. Thank you. The name of my poem is Grandma's Prayer. Who's that knocking at the door, dear Liza? Who's that knocking at the door? See that shadow round the moor there, Liza? See that shadow round the moor? You be careful if you go out, Liza. You be careful. Think a spell. Clear from COVID, you must hide well, Liza. Clear from COVID, hide you well. If I die, now don't you cry, my Liza. 
If I die now, don't you weep. I'll be stitching on the old quilt, Liza. Grandma's love for you goes deep. This nest's yours to have forever, Liza. This nest's yours, your soul to keep. Spring is coming round the corner, Liza. Spring is coming. Go to sleep. Thank you. I, I know I can't hear you, but thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us in just in time as well. I'm delighted you could. And thanks and congratulations. Thank you so much. Okay, superb. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of the competition poetry part of this main section of the event uh, to make things complicated. Um, so we're going to move on to the contributors to the actual, um, to, to the book from the five word challenges that were held at Ovale over the, over the course of the past year. Um, so you know who you are. Um, hopefully you will have, you can, if you could have one of your poems ready uh, to read. Um, um, I'd, if, and if you would like to read one of your poems, indeed, if you could just put in uh, five words and your name into the chat box, and then I, then I can pop you onto the list. And those are the five word challenge poems in the anthology, uh, which you have uh, either as a PDF or you should have the poems yourself because you sent them to me. Um, so if you could just pop your name in, that would be great. If you'd like to read your five word poem. Okay, we've got Sue Blue up first, that's superb. I know there's a few, quite a few more among you who have your uh, poems with you. We've got Ada, all right, superb. You know, um, I'm a big fan of the poet Anne Carson and I'm sure a lot of you are. And I, I uh, was very surprised, you know, every year when I put this anthology together, um, I, I go hunting for, for, for some reference to the idea of five things, you know, um, to, to use as a, as a kind of um, uh, epigraph at the beginning of the book. Um, and it just so happened that I, I found this beautiful uh, little paragraph from Anne Carson. And she said, that is when you feel most alive in your life, when your thinking moves. What I do in order to think is just take five things. It could be the five books on my desk or five words at random. Can you believe it? And try to make the mind move from one to the other. Just the connection is where the thinking happens. And I, I, I was just absolutely astounded to come across that. It really encapsulates, I think, the whole idea behind the five word challenge, you know. So we've, we've, been lucky enough to get that as the, uh, to have that in the front of this year's uh, anthology. All right, super. We have Sue, we have Ada, Pam, uh, to start us off with the contributors uh, from the Fiber Challenge section of the book. And uh, we'll see how we go from there. Uh, once that part is done, we will be moving over Augustina, you're in the anthology. You're definitely, uh, there's no one who sent me poems that isn't in the anthology, I can tell you that. So if you've sent me poems for the anthology, poems that you uh, wrote during the five word challenge part, right? So this is the, the secondary part of the anthology, then you're in there. You just have to, because uh, you don't have the book with you. Um, Augustina, I did paste the, um, I'm going to paste it again for everyone, the PDF link for those of you who don't have um, the, um, here comes Massimo Lavelle as well. He's definitely in there. Uh, you're definitely in there. We, we've got at least, I'd say a dozen people here who are in that part of the book. Um, uh, so, okay, that's great. We've got five, five people to start off with. Um, so whenever you're ready, Sue, Russell and Blue, we would love to hear your poem. Right, let me unmute myself. Um, and um, 
I'm going to, uh, I've, yeah, um, I was here last year um, and I was just after translating uh, the Panther by Rainer Maria Rilke yet again of the thousands of translations that there are. And this year, um, the five word poem that um, I wrote, that is one of the ones and I'm honored to have a, a few in there, uh, thanks very much. Um, that uh, is um, um, kind of after the Panther by Rilke. So you'll hear kind of uh, um, the, um, yeah, you, you'll hear that. So the words were witness, weeds, circle, purple and ground. Okay. Breaking the ban. Our bare feet have walked a warm circle on the cold tiles of the kitchen ground. Like the panther in the cage we pace, treading towards a future stagnant in the now. With cat's eyes jaded, we blink as we witness the weeds grow, slow as rising swirls of purple smoke. If we could as we would, we'd take our bare souls and tread a circle in the meadows, where we would light our fire and let the purple haze rise beyond the pupils of our eyes, beyond the field of vision. And we'd burst that cage two by two by two and break out from the stagnant now, break the ban, the circle and wake the panther's will from its benumbed silence, slip through its pupil's veil and conquer the world again. That's it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Sue. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> next we have Ada. Ada Miles. Thanks, Paul. Such an honor to be in the book, even without being shortlisted. <laughs> I have, I have, I'm really, uh, I have doubts, so I'll give you a choice. Would you rather like to hear the poem dealing with Kubrick, uh, Stanley Kubrick, or the other poem dealing with Handel and Gretel? It's a bit of a fairy tale poem. <laughs> uh, I, I just don't know which to pick. <laughs> flip a coin. Go with the first one. Okay, this is Kubrick, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, it's, the words were Eldridge, Moon, Pig, Shoehorn, and Grapefruit. It's called The Moon Pig Liveth or Kubrick's Lament. When Kubrick grew his moon pig, he thought it would be the size of an average grapefruit. But the eldritch thing bent like a shoehorn, bent like a shoehorn, was as big as he. One day, the moon pig, it left its lab pit, size of a Kubrick, and off the thing flew. Said Kubrick, said Stan, stared at the empty moon sty and swearing switched off the lab lights. That's it. Thanks. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Ada. Thank you. Um, okay, the list is getting uh, much longer now. Thank you. For, the, for those who've just arrived, um, please, of course, um, uh, uh, you're welcome now. This is the time to read a poem from the book that you've got into the book. Um, um, like Massimo, I know you've just arrived. Hi, how are you doing? Um, good to see you. Uh, there, I'm sure there is a poem in the book of yours. Um, is there not? Or am I wrong? There is. Yeah, there is. So I've just posted the link to the PDF there. If you want to take a look at that, um, I can pop you on the list for, for that. And I've got Rab saying he'd like someone to read his poem because he's got no audio. Uh, so we've got you on the list as well, Rab, no problem. Um, so thank you, uh, everyone so far has signed up and we've come to Pam Campbell. Hi, Pam. Hi, um, okay, my words are goddess, sanity, cynical, birthday, and woman. Needle woman, goddess of stitch and beam support, holding babies, lovers, and strangers, in the small cynical curl of troubled space, tugging and tearing at your sanity. Your breath, the light and the dark of day, O oh, carver of birthdays of others, stitch an underpinning of yours. Thank you. Lovely, thank you, Pam. 
And next uh, on the list, we have Augustina Adiolo Cecchino. Hey, um, where did it go? One second. So this one is Tokes and Sips. I hope my audio is okay. It's always playing. Is it fine? Thumbs up. Perfect. And the five words were cockroach, thread, sip, cascade, and strand. By that point, a sip of wine was no longer enjoyable. Everything tasted bland and she found herself unemployable. Each strand of hair, no more care, stringy like polyester thread. How much longer was she supposed to bear isolation and boredom? Stubborn as a cockroach, well, that's what people always called her, resilient. But, but six months of being 90% alone has humbled her, or more like crumbled her, rumbled her, she stumbles to the couch. A cascade of emotions that have no release whatsoever anymore. See how far she has strayed? Laid there, legs spread, wide and feeling inhuman, closer to an alien that does not belong in whatever this mess is. Rolls around her stomach that never existed, stinking of neglect and loss of self, Roaches is what she rolls. Tokes all day is the new routine. Tokes and sips of bland wine. Thank you. Thanks, Adiola. Thank you, Adiola. I mean, Augustina. That's your your um, second name. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Augustina. I don't know why that kind of caught in my head. Um, fabulous. Um, and next we have, if you're ready, Mags Queden. I think it's something fast here. <clears throat> well, I think I'll just do um, the one there with the ladies, uh, Women's International Day one. Okay, but just okay. before you do that, I need to just uh, sing your praises slightly here now, okay? Because um, once again, <laughs> um, you know, how many years now have you been giving us these fantastic sketches of our regulars and putting them into the book? Um, for like us, faces. Right? Yeah, there are just some superb ones again this year, absolutely brilliant. And because we've got an online PDF, the online version has got them all in color, you know, which is which is Ooh. even more interesting. You know, it's the, print, the print book um, obviously is it's in black and white, so not quite as impressive, but still immensely impressive. And you had so many of them done, so just wanted to say a big thank you for that. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's kind of rude to sketch on Zoom, but sometimes I just can't help that I did a few after sketches. I love seeing the faces and their moment, and their soulful moment. So I'll, re I'll read this one for the ladies. All hail. Um, thank you, Paul. On this day, to the warriors, the ladies, all hail. The suffragettes, the Amazons, the gladiators, the trailblazers, the enclosed, the cloistered, who offer it up, sip the sacrificial sup. The goddess Venus in her birthday shyness, arching from her shell, forever frozen, a buster like a pearl. Botticelli's, the Toulouse Lautrec, the Gustav Klimt, in brocades, jewel colours, cloaks of mosaic, stucco light relief, in gold leaf. The social activist reformers, cynical of the suits, who maintain their sanity, challenge complacency. Pursuit of ubiquitous slots, the poor perium, vessels of the seed, silent in their waiting chamber to the vocal puff when they need to be. All mothers are amazing, while some struggle to stay sane. To those with discipline, fair play. To those who fight their trials every single day, who stay to battle in their painful corner, come what may. Goddess Stanu, pity of the pap. Woman of New Grange, who welcomes the sun at solstice and some at equinox. Bridget of the Cross and Governor of the Albino, dear the bees. The domestic goddess on a budget himself slinks off for a beer. Well done to all the women who made me what I am. God love them. This my beautiful daughter, an example, my inspiration. But Judy, Kamala and Oprah. With every trafficked woman and every prisoner conscious, all hail. <clears throat> it was because I was last on the list I kept writing. <laughs> That's a brilliant poem and a, a really great winner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
All right, great. Um, next we have Cedric Picomte. You ready, Cedric? So uh, the poem, uh, so it was five words, and the five words were movement, slip, cave, lilac, and scone. And the title of the poem was Sacred Sea. Motionless, I rest my body on the earth, rocky and rough. The cave over me spans its shelter rugged black against blue sky. Branches of a lilac overhang from a bow, their vines of blossom, a draping curtain of scent. Before me stretches the vastness of the ocean, eternally in motion, the movement of each wave, creating crowns of light. And before I know it, I brush the last, the last crumbs of my scone from my chest and slip into the waves, cold and refreshing to body and mind. And as the sacred sea embraces, entire, embraces me entirely. Lovely. Which is it? Thank you, Cedric. It's, it's, not my, it's not mine, by the way, it's two poem. Oh, you, yeah. You, you read Sue's, yeah. Okay, I know we're, we're all yes. doing our own this time, but that's absolutely fine. Just, <laughs> Sorry, uh, I forgot to say that. <laughs> My it's okay. No, it's, I know it is not mine. In the real life setting, of course, that's what we used to do. We used to read each other's <laughs> It's just, you know, it's so complicated as it is, you know. We decided to drop that section of it. But I'll tell you what, I mean, Cedric, if you'd like to read one of your own, please do. You know, would you like to read one of your own too? Oh, uh, I can read one of my own, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, please. Um, all right. I will. Um, the five words. The five words for that day were magic, time, quants, onion, and loony. And the title is the intruder. Every tick of the wristwatch was a layer of the end, forever gone, along with some of his humanity. His hope for a future to come as depend. This was no magic, but far beyond science. His group applied something they hardly understood, too desperate to act in good conscience. They thought themselves out of time, thus focused all attention on the result that they thought solution, really the ultimate crime. A laboratory for chapel, a pedestal for altar. They sacrificed the solid one with no qualms. After all, loony creatures do not falter. He entered the machine and exited the word, watched his mortal shell peered like an onion, while the tall hand of his watch was hanging, was a hanging Damocles sword. At the end that he reached, there was nothing left, not even his former self but the duty to keep open the gate of the domain he had just breached. Oh, Fabulous. Thank you, Cedric. Thank you. Um, okay, and next on the list we have, if you're ready, Moira Stevens. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do this one. This was the very first time I came to Avail um, and was my first experience of a five-word challenge. And I just keep coming back. Um, so the words were spaghetti, storm, elucidate, exactly, and carbon. Spaghetti strips of language. Spaghetti strips of language, coiling, entwined, entangled, whirling in my brain, mind lost in the morass, the mess of otherness. Cold carbon copies of logic explain nothing, neither enlighten nor elucidate. Storms, turmoil, ever twisting, resisting my understanding. What exactly is its purpose? To toil, to strive, to know another's thoughts, to feel another's pain. Spaghetti strips of language, eating, 
at my brain. All right, okay. super. Thank you. Thank you, Moira. Uh, okay, we've got about uh, five more uh, of the contributors um, before we go on to the other people's um, open mic. I see I've got a question about that there from Paul. Um, so that is going ahead. Don't you worry about that. And someone else asked about, can is there a link to buy hard copies of the book? Now, it, it's a limited edition at the moment. Um, so we've got kind of two copies for all of the kind of competition winners and our reserve copies for all of the contributors. You know, so the, I'm keeping copies. I've still got copies for the contributors from last year because that was our very first online event was exactly this time last year. Um, we managed to get away with our March event uh, without all getting COVID, you know. <laughs> um, and then a month later, we went online. Um, so uh, our regular uh, attendees didn't get their copies of last year's book either. So I still got copies for them. But, you know, we, we, it's not really, um, there's no financial foundation to, to the anthology. Uh, you know, we certainly, you know, don't try and make any money out of it. But for those of you who do or are looking for extra copies, you know, uh, you can send us you can send us a, a message and we'll we'll try and get one to you you know maybe charge you a small small nominal fee few euros for it and um, plus postage but um, for all of the people who are in the book you know you will be getting them uh, down the line one way or the other you know we'll be posting them to you or meeting you in town to hand them over um, so we will get to you don't you worry um, but if you have other queries about that give us an email and I'll clarify that. All right, so as I said, um, one, two, three, four, five left on the on the contributors section. And next up, we'd love to welcome Colm Scully. Thanks, Paul. Uh, this is a short one, and it's on the environmental team. Um, there's a bit of an environmental team tonight. So um, uh, then the words were B-flat, ghosts, premonitions, honey, and choir. And it was called Daydream. Ghostly choir of honeybees swarm to the world's last hive, buzzing a funerary dirge in B flat. A premonition? That's it. Short and sweet. Thank you, Cullum. Um, Cullum, who uh, I must say has got an absolutely brilliant poetry film out there at the moment, taking the world by storm. <laughs> this little animation, gorgeous. So look up Cullum Scully. And his his latest poetry film. He's he's got loads of poetry films. Thanks, Colin. Um, next up, we have uh, Lauren O'Donovan. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you very much. Um, this one's a bit of a fun one on the theme of Shakespeare, which uh, Laura so wonderfully brought up uh, earlier during the five word challenge. Uh, it's called Recipe for a Sonnet. Um, the words were lasagna, count moonlight, breath, and fume. So, if you wish to write sonnets like Shakespeare, you first need to pull random words from air. No, first you need a glass of wine or beer. Only then fortuitous words appear, like lasagna or golf ball or bluebells. But avoid uh, nouns like purple or orange and make sure you count up the syllables or you'll end up with nonsense junk like anti-disestablishment, diarianism, orange. Next... You must rest with thoughts contemporary, like does four lines rhyme with moonlight, then work A, B, A, B until you're crazy, and fume posy till you starve for fresh breath. But let's face it, no one here is Shakespeare, most of all me, the sonnet has made clear. Okay, superb. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> Um, yeah, I can see uh, Matthew Sweeney and Shakespeare having a go, you know, the sonnet, the sonneteer versus the sustainer. Thank you for that. Okay, just three left. Um, Massimo, are you ready? Yes. Hey, happy anniversary. And thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so this one uh, was from January, and the five words were lilac. Slip, cave, stillness, and scone. 
<clears throat> so um, one of the most beautiful sounds that I've ever heard in my life was the voice of Jeff, Jeff Buckley as he sang, Lilac wine is sweet and heady like my love. A beautiful song to slip into, to allow the walls of my mind to soften without caving in. Music is a beautiful way to find the stillness of repose without denying our desire to pulsate as beings of movement. So instead of wine and a pill in the evening or coffee and a scone in the morning, I'll take music any time of day or night as my favorite way to find eternal rest in a finite moment. All right, thanks a lot. Fabulous. Thank you, Massimo. It's great, great to have you with us. Okay. Um, our penultimate uh, uh, poem from the anthology is from Rab Urquhart, who is with us, um, but uh, not in audio. So, I mean, not microphone wise. So, Rosie is going to, has volunteered to read Rab's um, piece of, I think, prose, pro, prose poem. Prose poem, yeah. And it's the same words that Massimo just um, had in his poems. Uh, that was obviously a, a good night for uh, the old five word poems because a few of them have been read already. Um, Movement, Slip, Cave, Scone and Lilac um, by Rab Urquhart. The Bruce noticed a spider as it slipped down its silken thread. He watched as it climbed back up then scuttled down the rock face before launching itself into space, swinging trying to reach the wall on the other side. He watched as it repeated its efforts over and over, inching closer until finally it succeeded. Leaving the cave, he plucked a lilac for luck and headed for scone. Thus was the movement begun. <laughs> Thanks, Rosie, and thank you, Rab. Um... And finally, unless there's anyone else out there who has a poem inside the anthology who hasn't read it yet, um, you're welcome to send us a last minute uh, message. Um, but I think our, our final reader is uh, Catherine Ronan. Welcome, Catherine. Hi. Hi, everyone. Great evening. Um, this is the five word challenge on the 18th of September last year. The words were hydro, tango, place culture and dowry. And this one's called my personal ad. I am a hydro Pisces willing to tango. I want to take you to an exotic place full of mirth and mischief, downtown culture, underground jazz, artists painting in the rain. This is donkey jacket cork. I offer you exotic, erotic and a little psychotic but no dowry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous, thank you, Catherine. Thanks a million for that. Okay, so, wow, there, there's, there, there's the, the bumper main event uh, come to its final conclusion. Yeah? Okay, I think, unless there, does anyone I've missed out on? I don't think there, there is. I haven't seen any final messages. So congratulations to everyone and thank you for your superb contributions over the past year. Um, you can all give yourselves a huge round of applause. Thanks so much. And thank you to our competition winners, um, Laura Tace and uh, Jill Monroe and uh, Sinead McClure and to all the shortlisted poets, to all of the <clears throat> pandemic and lockdown poets. Uh, thank you so much. You've made a really, really brilliant book. And once again, it's online. You know, you've got the link to the PDF. Uh, it's a fantastic read. So do enjoy it. Enjoy the, the wonderful uh, images in there. We've also got two, two really brilliant sketches by our other in-house artist, Eileen Healy, who's done two incredible images of Charles and Rab, two of our regulars of many, many years. You'll see those towards the end of the book, uh, just after Rab's poem, actually. Um, 
So those as well as mags to 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 look through are you know to give the eye some some delight as well as the the poetry soul. So thank you all for for those wonderful contributions. Um, okay, hang on. You know what? Here, here I've just had a final. I've had a final final message from someone. There's somebody else out there want to do it. Though. But uh, perhaps somebody else would else like to read it. I've just had uh, a text message from Kieran McCartan, who's at Rab's place with Rab, who also therefore doesn't have a microphone. And Kieran does have uh, a poem in the book, I think. Does he? He should better have after that. No, he doesn't. Kieran, you don't have a poem in the book. What are you on about? You never sent one in. No, no poem here for Kieran, but thanks, Kieran. <laughs> okay, thanks for trying. <laughs> we'll make sure to knock on your door for next year for sure. And sorry, you're not with us tonight. Okay, so I'm going to hand back to to uh, my better half now, who is now going to run the uh, open mic session for only other poets' poetry. So if you're ready to start, whenever you like, you can start popping your names into the chat. And you just go open mic and your name, and then you'll go onto the list. So let's use first there. Actually, Catherine's first, and, and I'll start writing, filling in the list. Thanks, everyone. And here's Rosie. Hey, Acolyte. Hey, everyone. Wow, well, that was uh, pretty blown away by all of that. Uh, lots of great poems, really great poems. I had to write a few little things down in my diary so that I get the juices flowing for me. So thank you so much to everyone that took part there. Um, so yeah, this is other people's poetry. So dig deep to those people that inspire you in your uh, creative process and give them space, give them your lovely voices. So first up we have Catherine Ronan, take it away. This poem is called Noah and it's by Matthew Geedon. Noah. His hands were rough, coarse sandpaper that tried to round the edges of his words as he spoke. Large crowds turned up to mock him and his righteous claims of how it would all end in tears, a flood to wash away the sins and laughter resounding in his ears. Rumours spread that even his wife thought him mad muttering darkly that his chats with God had gone to his head. Soon nobody listened. They didn't want to hear all that end of the world is nigh nice stuff, but busied themselves with the day-to-day -day of coins, cards and casual sex. No one seemed to notice the steady rain until too late and the ark had gone. Floating out over the fields, the last hope lost from his sinking land. Mostly, he missed his hometown, the familiar faces in the street. Even the bad jokes made it at his expense. Many nights he lay awake, uncertain what he was doing in this travelling zoo, angered by the cool calm of the ocean. Sometimes he thought he heard the voice of someone he missed calling out for help, crying in the wind. His wife eyed him wearily. His faith had become a burden and he wondered how long he could carry on this charade, wearily waiting for the world to begin again. Wow, thanks Catherine. And now we're going to have Mary O'Connell. We don't have a visual, but I hope we have your audio, Mary, if you'd like to unmute yourself. She was there two seconds ago. She? Mm. She's not there. We might come back to Mary. I think she might have just left us a second. Ah, ah, okay. So next up we will have... Um, Lauren O'Donovan, please. Thank you. Uh, this one is by Ogden Nash, and it's called The Tale of Custard the Dragon. 
Belinda lived in a little white house with a little black kitten and a little grey mouse and a little yellow dog and a little yellow dragon and a really old, truly old little pet dragon. Now, the name of the little black kitten was Ink and the little grey mouse, she called her Blink. And the little yellow dog was as sharp as mustard, but the dragon was a coward and she called him Custard. Custard the dragon had big sharp teeth and spikes on top of him and scales underneath. Mouth like a fireplace, chimney for a nose, and Relio, Trulio, daggers on his toes. Belinda was as brave as a barrel full of bears, and Ink and Blink chased lions down the stairs. Mustard was as brave as a tiger in a rage, but Custard cried for a nice safe cage. Belinda tickled him, she tickled him unmerciful. Ink, Blink and Mustard, they rudely called him Percival. They all sat, sat laughing in the little red wagon at the Relio Trulio Cowardly Dragon. Belinda giggled till she shook the house and Blink said, weak, which is giggling for a mouse. Ink and Mustard rudely asked his age when Custard cried for a nice safe cage. Suddenly, suddenly they heard a nasty sound and Mustard growled and they all looked around. Meowch, cried Ink, and oh, cried Belinda, for there was a pirate climbing in the window. Pistol in his left hand, pistol in his right, and he held in his teeth a cup less bright. His beard was black, one leg was wood. It was clear that the pirate meant no good. Belinda paled, and she cried, help, help, but Mustard fled with a terrified yelp. Ink trickled down to the bottom of the household. And little mouse blink strategically mousehold. But up jumped Custard, snorting like an engine, clashing his tail like irons in a dungeon. With a clatter and a clank and a jangling squirm, he went at the pirate like a robin at a worm. The pirate gaped at Belinda's dragon and gulped some grog from his pocket flagon. He fired two bullets, but they didn't hit, and Custard gobbled him every bit. Belinda embraced him. Mustard licked him. No one moored, mourned for his pirate victim. Ink and blink in glee did gyrate around the dragon that ate the pirate. Belinda still lives in her little white house with her little black kitten and her little grey mouse and her little yellow dog and her little red wagon and her Relio Trulio little pet dragon. Belinda is as brave as a barrel full of bears and ink and blink chase lions down the stairs. Mustard is as brave as a tiger in a rage, but Custard keeps crying for a nice safe cage. Thanks. Excellent. It's so important to stay in tune with your inner child, I believe. So thanks so much for that, Lauren. I'm with you. Um, and I think there was a question there just a bit from Massimo about uh, whether it's Oveil Poets. It's wide open, so you can pick any poet that, that you love or hate, any poet you want to read, that's great with us. Okay, so next up, can we please have Paul Rabinowitz? I hope I said that right. You did, thank you very much. And it's, uh, I loved hearing the five word poems. It's the first time I was bathed in all of that. And it was really great, it was really wonderful. So great stuff, all of you folks that are contributors to this five word poetry, it's amazing stuff. So, um, it's funny, I, I've been reading now for about eight years and I've never been nervous till today where I'm actually reading somebody else's work who happens to be here tonight. Uh, she's uh, right now in residency on the West Coast in a bucolic and beautiful place among the cedars in uh, Western Washington state. And I'm gonna read C. Marie Furman, who's the author of this wonderful book called uh, Floodgate Poetry Series. And she's the author of Camp Beneath the Dam, uh, Floodgate 2020, and co-editor of Native Voices, Tupelo 2019. Um, she resides in the mountains of western central Idaho, but now she's virtual in Cork, Ireland. So why not? Now, I've been reading a lot of C. Marie lately, very much uh, into her um, poetry and her, the way she deals with the land. This is called Camp Beneath the Dam. Camped beneath Hell's Canyon Dam, 
Last night it started raining. I moved my head outside the tent and let rain fill the hollows of my eyes. I never saw lightning, but heard thunder roll from beneath me. The earth upside down, hooves of animals bolting through clouds. It started raining lamprey and sturgeon. It rained so hard last night, I was young again. It rained so hard, the earth moved from the graves of my grandparents. Their bones started dancing on the rocks, dancing like hell. It rained so hard, the river was young again. Neither of us had our second names. We chewed dirt with our first teeth. We ran together with salmon, steelhead. The shores lifted their skirts at our passing. Last night, the rain brought back my grandmother. She put my head in her lap. She told me stories. She told me carp sucked the bones of my grandfather. Her tears filled my eyes. Her braids tickled my cheek. This morning, the skies are clear. A fly dances on my nose. In the flooding light, I move earthworms from the trail. Sometimes I toss their wet red bodies back into the river. Thank you. Wow, wow. I got goosebumps for that. It's beautiful reading and an amazing poem. So it's good to see the author amongst us too. Um, wow. So next, can we please have Margaret O'Regan? Um, my poet is here tonight as well. And it's an IT poem. It, ha it has a lot of layers. I love it. I've always loved it. And every time I read it, I see hidden depths to it. It has huge underlying currents. It's very well crafted. And above all, it's full of wit and humour. It's written by Seamus Harrington, one of our own members. Um, it's called Free Downloads. They've altered my application activated my archives, booted my browser, buried my broadband, bookmarked my bits, connected my console, captured my cartridge, clicked on my cookies, commandeered my cursor, dropped down my devices, delved in my downloads, documented my data, dragged out my driver, displayed my desktop, erased my errata, encrypted my emails, fancied my favorites, fumbled my floppy, fragmented my fonts, firewalled my folders, gorged on my gigabytes, grouped up my game ports, hijacked my hardware, hacked at my hyperlink, hung out my homepage, hosted my hard drive, inserted my icon, interrupted my intranet, jellied my Java, jumpered my jack plug, keystroked my kernel, kneaded my knickknacks, logged on my laptop, labeled my language, massaged my poor mouse, merged with my modem, minimized my monitor, muddled my memory, memorized my moniker, negated my network, networked my nonsense, opened my outputs, outsourced my options, plagiarized my process, programmed my printer, punctured my pop-ups, partitioned my password, queried my QWERTY, questioned my query, quoted my quandary, raided my right-click, recycled my registry, selected my software, sampled my startup, serviced my smart drive, scheduled my scanner, sentenced my shortcuts, trespassed my trackball, 
trojaned my toolbar, uncovered my uploads, underlined my undo, violated my version, vetoed my vectors, vented my volumes, warmed in my window, winkled my wizard, X-rated my excerpts, yawned at my yarns, and zeroed my zip drive. That's by Seamus Harrington, who's here tonight as well. Nice. I just think it's wonderful. He is. He's here. He's listening in anyway, I hope. Good on you, Seamus, and fair play to you, Margaret, for reading it. Um, next up, can we please have Karen Warinsky, please? Okay, I hope you can hear me. I see I'm on the screen. Um, I'm going to read a piece by Joy Harjo, who was the U.S. Poet Laureate back in 2019. And she's a Native American lady, a uh, woman from the Creek Nation. And so I'm going to call this up. And I thought about reading it because uh, I have an eagle that lives across the street from me and uh, he was on my mind. So it's called Eagle Poem. To pray, you open your whole self to sky, to earth, to sun, to moon, to one whole voice that is you. And know there is more that you can't see, can't hear, can't know except in moments steadily growing and in languages that aren't always sound, but other circles of motion. Like Eagle that Sunday morning over Salt River, circled in blue sky, in wind, swept our hearts clean with sacred wings. We see you, see ourselves, and know that we must take the utmost care and kindness in all things. Breathe in, knowing we're made of all this, and breathe, knowing we are truly blessed because we were born and die soon within a true circle of motion. Like eagle rounding out the morning inside us, we pray that it will be done in beauty, in beauty. That's her poem. Thank you, Karen. I know I'll certainly be checking out Joy Harjo after this. Wow, she seems like a poet for our times. We all need to be getting on that bandwagon. Okay, for the next up, can we please have Aidan, Aidan Miles, please? Thanks. Uh, I chose a poem by Sue Blue, also known as Rosalind Blue. It's in Contributions to Volume 13, which I'm very grateful to have received as a physical paper copy. It's cute. Um, wait, let me find it. Um, it's called Beauty Destroyed, and the words were football, speckle, local, leather, fubar. Fubar is, as, a, as far as I understand, an abbreviation of fucked up beyond any recognition, and I just love how poetically it appears in the poem. Uh, so, beauty destroyed. The speckled sky above the estuary gleams blue and grey in the evening light. The tide is out, reels the local river, meandering Italian specks of land on the way to sea. The drained sand shimmering of water mirrors the actual sphere above. A cold breeze today. I pull the leather close around my chest and watch the football. That's been soaking in the river for weeks, bobbing in the overflow, looking all for bar, just like the meadow around it, brown from roundup spray and riddled with plastic. That's it. Love the poem. Thank you, Ada. Um, the next up, we have the lady you just paid homage to. Sue Blue, please. Thank you so much. Uh, it almost feels too much um, to, you know, um, with Cedric before as well. As, um, so thanks, women, and I'm honored. Um, I am um, going to um, present one of the translations that I've done during the lockdown. And, um, you know, the lockdown is the perfect time to use uh, for doing what you always say you would. So uh, 
my grandmother used to perform these German classic poems um, in the kitchen when she was old. And um, that, I think, is part of what inspired me to actually perform poetry. And uh, I also chose this particular poem for, to, for, for today because it has a, quite an Irish kind of angle to it. Um, and it tells a little story. Now, it's relatively long. Question is, uh, will I read it in both versions, um, the German first and then English, or would I just read the English, guys? Um, Rosie, can you give me a check up there on time? Is is it okay if I read the German and English? I'd say go for it, so long as they're not like five minutes long each, you know, that kind of thing, you know? No, 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 that's not, that's, yeah, no, they're not like that. Okay, yeah. so uh, as, as I haven't practiced, I'll try to wrap my tongue around the, uh, the German one, um, and this is by Theodor Fontana, and uh, it's called Herr Ribbeck von Ribbeck. No, Herr von Ribbeck auf Ribbeck. Herr von Ribbeck auf Ribbeck im Havelland, ein Birnbaum in seinem Garten stand. Und kam die goldene Herbsteszeit, und die Birnen leuchteten weit und breit. Da stopfte, wenn's Mittag vom Turme scholl, der von Ribbeck sich beide Taschen voll. Und kam in Pantinen ein Junge daher, so rief er, Junge, willst du ne Bär? Und kam ein Mädel, so rief er, Le Dirn, guck mal rüber, ich heb ne Birn. So ging es viele Jahre, so ging es viele Jahre, bis Lobesam, der von Ribbeck auf Ribbeck zum Sterben kam. Er fühlte sein Ende, es war Herbsteszeit, wieder lachten die, wieder, wieder lachten die Birnen weit und breit, da sagte von Ribbeck, von Rebeck, ich scheide nun ab, legt mir eine Birne mit ins Grab. Und drei Tage drauf aus dem Doppeldachhaus trugen von Rebeck sie hinaus. Alle Bauern und Brüder mit Feiergesicht sangen Jesus meine Zuversicht und die Kinder klagten das Herz schwer. Hieß tot nun, wer gift es nun ne Bier? So klagten die Kinder, das war nicht recht. Ach, sie kannten den alten Ribbeck schlecht. Der Neue freilich, der knausert und spart, hält Park und Birnbaum strenge verwahrt. Aber der Alte, vorahnend schon und voll Misstrauen gegen den eigenen Sohn, der wusste genau, was er damals tat, als um eine Birn ins Grab er bat. Und im dritten Jahr aus dem stillen Haus ein Birnbaumsprössling sprost heraus. Und die Jahre gingen wohl auf und ab, längst wölbt sich ein Birnbaum über dem Grab und in der goldenen Herbsteszeit leuchtet's wieder weit und breit. Und kommt ein Jung über den Kirchhof her, so flüstert's im Baume, willst du ne Bär? Und kommt ein Mädel, so flüstert's, lüt dirn, komm an rüber, ich geb dir ne Birn. So spendet der Segen noch immer die Hand des von Ribbeck auf Ribbeck im Havelland. Lord von Ribbeck, from Ribbeck. Lord von Ribbeck, from Ribbeck, in the Havelland, had a pear tree in his garden stand. When the golden time of autumn arrived, and the pears were beaming far and wide, Lord von Ribbeck, when the bells chimed noon, stuffed both his pockets full of them soon. And when in his clogs a boy to him came, he'd call out, Lad, would you like a pear? And when a girl came along, he'd exclaim, Little lass, have a pair, come on over here. And thus it went on many years, till God bless, the time came for Rebecca from Rebecca to pass. He felt his end near, it was autumn time, again pears were smiling far and wide. When from Rebecca said, I'll now pass away, lay a pair down with me into the grave. And three days on from the double-ridged house, they carried the old Lord von Ribbeck out. All farmers and peasants with solemn face sang, Jesus be my confidence. And the children mourned him with heavy hearts. He's dead now. Who now has a pair for us? So the children lamented, yet that was unjust. Oh, they did not know old von Ribbeck enough. The new one, surely, is stringy and hard, keeps pack and pear tree bolted and barred. But the old man, following a boding hunch, was full of mistrust against his old, 
against his own son. Exactly he knew the instruction he gave when he asked that a pear be put into his grave. And in the third year from the quiet house, a sweet little pear tree sapling sprouts. And the years were passing by up and down, a pear tree bends over the grave long by now. And in the golden autumn time, it gleams again from far and wide. And when through the churchyard goes a boy, in the tree it whispers, would you like a pear? And it whispers too when a girl passes by, we lass have a pear, come on over my dear. Thus still comes a blessing from the old hand of von Rebeck from Rebeck in the Havel land. That's me and Theodore Fontana out. Thank you, Sue. I, I ran to the loo when you were doing the German bit and I missed the very beginning. So I'm sorry about that because I really loved <laughs> the, the rest. Um, wow. Yeah. Excellent. Next, can we please have Moira Stevens, please? Hi. Um, this poem has been my favourite since a uh, teacher read it to us first of all in my last year at primary school and I loved it so much I copied it out no photocopies or anything in those days and learnt it off by heart and I still love this poem it's The Listeners by Walter de la Mare Is there anybody there said the traveller knocking on the moonlit door and his horse in the silence champed the grasses of the forest's ferny floor. And a bird flew up out of the turret above the traveller's head, and he smote upon the door again a second time. Is there anybody there? he said. But no one descended to the traveller. No head from the leaf-fringed sill leaned over and looked into his grey eyes, where he stood perplexed and still but only a host of phantom listeners that dwelt in the lone house then stood listening in the quiet of the moonlight to that voice from the world of men stood thronging the faint moonbeams on the dark stair that goes down to the empty hall hearkening in an air stirred and shaken by the lonely traveller's call and he felt in his heart their strangeness, their stillness, answering his cry, while his horse moved, cropping the dark turf, neath the starred and leafy sky. For he suddenly smote on the door even louder and lifted his head. Tell them I came and no one answered, that I kept my word, he said. Never the least stir made the listeners, though every Every word he spake felt echoing through the shadowiness of the still house from the one man left awake. Aye, they heard his foot upon the stirrup and the sound of iron on stone and how the silence surged softly backwards when the plunging hooves were gone. Wow, you can see how that would really capture a child's um, imagination, awe and fear too, I suppose. Beautiful. Actually, it's probably worth thinking of doing a series of poems that we all loved as ch in childhood because uh, they're not such childish things indeed. Wow, that was amazing. Um, next up. Can we please have Colm Scully? Thanks, Rosie. Um, this is a poem I just uh, came across on the internet, and it's by George Bilgere. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but he's an American poet. I never came across him before, uh, but he, he seems to be quite successful, and it's called Once Again I Fail to Read an Important Novel. Instead, we sit together beside a fountain, the important novel. Oh dear, Colm, you have frozen in time for us just there. Um, 
Okay, we're going to move along and we'll come back to you. Hopefully your connection will right itself in the meantime. Um, okay. So next up, can we please have Augustina, please? Hey, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Um, this is another one from Sue, Sue Blue. Um, yeah, <laughs> I know you're blushing now. The first day that I actually met her is the day that she read this poem. And that was when I was like, yeah, I, I need to know this person. Okay. Um, and ever since then, we've been in touch. So great, this poem. I have to read it. <laughs> it's called Moon Pause. Oh, how I miss the rhythm of my cycle, the joyful beating heart of my own womb. Waxing with the bloom of ovulation, waning for release with the red moon. In all of its complexion, all its aspects, I miss the beauty of this rhythm so, the throbbing rise from bleed to lustful times, the pause of dry days filled with other focus. The luscious sweetness, wanting, scented, pulse inducing on the wanton peak. The wildness of the freedom, post excitement and another dry pause, great to feel alone. Then letting go in riding ecstasy to civilize the rawness of my tempers and last the purge of slowly built up tension in the strength and weakness of my blood. Now there's no more cycle, no more moon to keep my time and keep me on route. No more build up, no release in bleeding, no juicy joy or pheromones to tell, no sharing of the wildness of the ride without the words to call out for my need and no relief from pressures of my moods in the soft surrender to the fleshy flood. Instead came long weeks of erratic flow, unreadable, bod unreadable my body, no relying. For many months I kept the flower closed, not knowing what on earth was going on. Then suddenly it was all gone. All still, I wait, and nothing stirs or grows inside me, one moon, two moons, and three, no drop, and I begin to miss it all so much. Instead now, I have daily sweaty outbreaks. My fans become my most important friend. As if I was broke, as if I was a broken thermostat, my nights too hot, too cold, full bladder up again. And when my monthly mood begins to tighten up to that pressure we call PMS, there now is no more saving outlook that in a few days time, my body will release. It all has given life a fuller meaning. I've had my play with fire every bloom. One time I have fulfilled my nature's role and will not miss the monthly pain at all. But oh, I miss the rhythm of my cycle, the joyful beating heart of my womb, no more now, there is only stillness, no more sweet rawness, no more moon. And I think that poem is excellent. Excellent indeed. It should go into I'm the so honored, thanks. And that was well read as well. Thank you so much. Absolutely. It should go into it. The Bible of women, the Bible for women, Rosalind. It's one of those. You know, it's one of those topics that you don't really get to discuss that much until you find yourself in it. Interesting. Um, yeah, thank you. So next up, we have none other than the um, All-Ireland Poetry Slam champion, Shauna Lee Lynch. Hi. Uh, how are you all? It's lovely to see everyone. And uh, it's been a wonderful night. Um, the poem I'm going to read is by Jack Shortland. Uh, Rosie mentioned earlier uh, she is a member of the community here in Cork and her friend and unfortunately passed away a couple of weeks ago. 
and uh, I was going mad because she is a really lovely person and you know a wonderful spirit to have upstairs in the Long Valley so I'm going to read one of her poems uh, she has loads of poems that you can see online but this one is a celebration of what the body can do uh, she loved dancing and uh, I'd be a, a partial to an old boogie myself so I've chosen this one as it's a bit of a celebration of life so it's called Dance Moves Dance. I hope I can do it justice now because she was a great reader. Fingers can't not twitch. Palms sense the percussion. Feet feel toes wriggle and soles and calves and thighs soak up the vibration from the soul of it. Knees take off, elbows mock them. Shoulders pick it up and go mad. Rolling, rolling. Ah, yes, we know this. The breath joins in. This is easy. Hips counter the shoulders and do their shimmy. Hip bone connected to the thigh bone, then bones, then bones. Brain remembers. What does the music want? Eyes soft, chance a look. What are the others doing? That's a good one. Face dares to share. Throat has a deep urge to shout out. This is the best thing ever. Here's the head. Don't let it spoil it. Back of the neck, shake it, shake it, hair. Feel the rattle bones and roll. Ro womb resounds with the drums, resonates with breasts content to wobble. And balls, too, if you had them. Don't stop us now. Heart thinks it's the beat. Tongue panting happily, needs restraining. Backbone pleasures itself. Sweat is salty and sweet enough. The body knows the tune. Thanks. Fair play, Shauna. Thank you for that. Um, where did you find your poems online? Um, if you Google Jack Shortland, there is some on different uh, WordPress sites and uh, different blogs and stuff. Um, so yeah, she, she had a wonderful spirit and I think it comes out through her poems. So. I'd recommend everybody checking her out. Yeah, you, you choose well there. I could uh, hear her voice. So thanks for that. Um, and just to say that we there's five more people on the list. And so if anybody else would like to put their names down to read a poem of somebody they really admire, that would be great. Um, but sure, keep on going in, mate. Next up, Pam Campbell, please. Okay. Um, I'm going to be reading from an Appalachian poet, Jim Wayne Miller, from his book, The Mountains Have Come Closer. <clears throat> and the name of this is The Briar Breathing. In the evening, when he walked down the, sleep, down the steep slope of his breath into the hollow of sleep, he distinguished all his different breathings. Breathing that fluttered like swallows in a chimney. Breathing that sang, easy, rhythmical, a cross-cut saw and timber. Breathing short, shallow strokes, chopping corn, whole blade clacking in rocks. Breathing that never bottomed out, but kept on giving, going, down like plowed new ground, still sinking underfoot as he passed on and came down soft again. Breathing so deep it went all the way home to a quiet cove where peewees called. Breathing that turned his body leafy, turned it cold, and came up out of a maze of passageways, a groundhog from its den. Breathing from so far back it trickled, transparent over rocks, and stood in sunlit pools where rivers spread wider and wider where shadows of leaves grew gills that slowly rose and fell. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. That was beautiful and beautifully read. So we lost you a little while ago, Colm. So we're going to come back to you and hopefully hold on to you for dear life this time. Sorry, uh, I, I'm not in the McGill McGillicuddy Reeks, but uh, for some reason uh, the internet drops out sometimes. This is a poem by um, George Bilguera. Did I? And um, 
it's called he's an American and it's called Once Again I Fail to Read an Important Novel. Instead, we sit together beside the fountain, the important novel and I. We're having coffee together in that quite first hour of the morning, respecting each other's silences in the shadow in this small but significant European city. All the characters can relax. I'm giving them the day off. For once they can forget about their problems, desire, betrayal, the fatal enuma, and just sit peacefully beside me. In the afternoon, at lunch near the cathedral, and in the evening after my lonely, historical walk along the promenade, the men and women, the children, and even the dogs in the important, complicated novel have nothing to fear from me. We will sit quietly at the table with a glass of cool red wine and listen to the pigeons questioning each other in the ancient corridors. Excellent stuff. Thanks, Colm. Um, can we next have Cal Holden, please? Hey, guys, how you doing? Um, I want to do a poem that was my very first intro to um, spoken word. Back before I'd, I'd even knew what spoken word was or read poetry or anything, I came across this guy and he came across this piece. I was about 16 to 17. Uh, I put it to memory because it blew me away. And I used to bring it out with my buddies anytime we'd had a couple of talks of a spliff or anything. I'd be like, guys, you gotta hear this poem. <laughs> this is the one. Um, and I guess it was memorizing that, going through that process that really turned it on for me first. It wasn't long before I started myself. But this one's Elohim, so Williams. In 1972, my mother was rushed with James Brown concert in order to give birth to me. My style is black hole. Most niggas simply sound like earth to me. If hip hop were the moon, I would be the first to bleed. Cyclical sacraments of self for all my peers to read. I recite the user night, provide the light for you to read by. Have you floating on cloud nine without realizing it's my mind sky? And the ground on which you talk is the tongue on which you walk is the tongue with which I talk. I speak the seas, I root the trees of suburbia and New York. The city streets can never claim me, that's why I never sound like you. All your niggas claim the streets that pass the woods ain't true you better walk your path you better do your math because your screw face can only make the buddha laugh and even if you know your lessons you don't know the half but don't take it from me son take a bath i can recite the grass on the hill and have memorized the moon i know the cloud forms of love by heart and have brought tears to the eye of the storm my memory banks vaults of autumn forests and amazon river banks and i scream them into sunsets and echo and earthquakes shadows have been my spotlight as i monologue the night and dialogue with days soliloquies of wind and breeze applauded by sun rays we put language in zoos to observe cage thought and toss peanuts and pea funk at intellect and motherfuckers think these are metaphors i speak what i see all words and worlds are metaphors of me my life was authored by the moon footprints written in soil the fountain pen of martian men noveling human toil and yes the soil speaks highly of me for earth seeds root me poetry and breed forests forever through recitation now Maybe I'm too serious, too little here, too matter, though I am riddled with the reason of the sun. A stand-up comet with an audience of lungs, this body of laughter is with me or at me, Hugh more or less, human though genders mute, and the punchline has its lifeline at its root. I am a star, this life is suburbs, I commute, make daily runs between the sun and earthly loot to raise my children to the height of light and truth. I love that piece. It blew me away. That was my end. I was like, whoa, that's the world. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Well, I, like, I can see why. And uh, amazing to like commit it to heart. Can you please tell us the name of the, the author again? Because I, I missed that at the very beginning. Uh, that's Saul Williams. Saul Williams. Saul Williams, guys. <sighs> okay. Next up, can we please have Tamara? Miles, please. Tamara, Tamara. Tamara, Miles, please. Thank you. Um, I'm a little bit in love with Morris Manning, so I have to read something by this marvelous poet. This is called The Woodcock. Good morning, all you finches. If not elated by the wind swaying the dry stalks where you can't perch, yet merely cling and swagger, then I've fallen shorter than I think of true relation. You look happy, 
with God's happiness to me. And that blots out a bleak sometimes I have prevailing. You have more of charity than all of us, though how we've needed it and need it bluntly now, a shock of regard, like a loaf of hard bread thrown from heaven. We need to get hit. And good night, you owls. And even you, old woodcock, buried in the brown but springing ground of the woods. All night I heard you chiding. Take that, you called a hundred times. And that, it is well I never see you or the love beyond our love in your eye. It would turn me away in tears to know your hammer reporting from the black and echoing is all for me. For being in one motion awake and restless with the revelation that answered is a prayer either I forgot I made. Or... Thank you. Beautiful stuff. And while I kind of listened to you all night, actually, that accent is just gorgeous. Um, Thank you. It's like being in the cinema. It's like, ooh, lovely. Thank do you. Do read more Morris Manning. Will do. Will do. Morris Manning. Thank you. Next up, um, Cornelia. Hi. Let me just see if I can actually match. Yes. Brilliant. Right, so I'd like to share a poem by um, by Stephen Bluestone, who is a poet from the US, um, from from based in Brooklyn. And um, Stephen and I met in the late nineties in Macon, Georgia, where he allowed me, where he taught English, and he allowed me um, to sit on in on his classes. And we then lost touch, and a few years ago, I um, visited. New York and so I looked him up and so we met again and Stephen who by the way has three poetry collections out there which are The Painted Clock and Other Poems, The Flagrant Dead and The M Laughing Monkeys of Gravity. Um, so he does something every year in the festive season so the season that includes Hanukkah, St. Nicholas, the winter solstice, Christmas, New Year is that he, um, he makes a card to celebrate this festive season and the end of the year. And the card usually um, contains an image, often a photograph, and a poem of his. And so I thought I'd share the one from the, last, from the most recent card, um, and it's called The Fixer. In the basement there were tools and the oldest uncle, The Fixer, whose bright face went out, went blank in the noisy rooms upstairs. Among the earth and root in the shaded yard, he coaxed sunlight to fall where he wanted it to, with his delicate long-handled hoe. And the mended things, better now, like children healed by light, ran laughing sliding down shoots into the coal bin of his arms. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Cornelia. I like that you're just Cornelia and you have no surname. It's mm. kind of, well, I know you do have one, but uh, for this virtual world, you are Cornelia. This is uh, just, uh, I like that anyway. <laughs> so I share it with the rest of you. Okay, next up, can we please have Kieran McCartain, please? How's it going? How's it now? Um, just to yeah, just to echo what Sean was saying a while ago, um, about about Jack Shortland, um, it was uh, yeah, very hard news to hear that she had passed on, and it was very hard not to be around you all when that happened, um, but um. Yeah, just to honour her tonight, I'm just going to read two of her poems. One of them's a little bit longer, one of them's very short. Um, but yeah, just to kind of further the comments that Shauna made earlier and other tributes that were made to her as well. Um, yeah, she's an absolutely fantastic um, person and a wonderful spirit and uh, was very warm-hearted and a, and a really insightful poet. 
um, and a big inspiration, you know. So these two poems um, are written by her, and uh, they were part. They were published in Porridge magazine. One of them is called Nature and Nurture, and it's for Gillian. I could see her life in her newborn face, my girl with her androgynous spirit. She smelled of her own earthiness. Her anima latched onto my breast. No bother to her, no frets. I laughed. I would have no work to do with her. Solid baby body, her birth glimpse of survival in the womb bigger than her brothers before her. I could feel it off her, her humor, her ability to lead, to nurture, to curse warmly, to soothe us all. The infant fist she would hold for life, to hurl a slitter, to feel the leather of it, to mind the hammer of her grandfather, she would want no princess dress, not my Superman in pajamas, not my transformer in disguise. Small, strong, moon woman. Dog loyal to her family, caretaker, craftsman, cat whisperer, best recruit. Solving our struggles, soldiering for us, chanting for us, dancing with us, touching somewhere in the core of us. And my notion, she was here before, walking the walls of the fort, looking out at her court. Her accent, a part of older lives, her real respect for the fight and their work and her sound humanity for it all. My little girl's dark eyes told me of a kind of knowing in our bonding and our mutual need for a back rub. Her full lips, a piece of her heritage, so very Irish, so fucking beautiful, and none of it any of my doing. And then the second one is just called On Dead and Dying. Dying is the plant that needs watering and relocating to the bathroom or a windowsill, a more, a more nourishing spot. Dying is not dead. Dead is a rotting mouse at the back of a cooker. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you, Kieran, and thank you, Jack, Jackie. Yeah, big thanks, big thanks to Jackie for those poems and for all her poems and her inspiration. Well, I'm kind of realizing that uh, I have I have a bit of reading to do. I need to catch up on Jack Shortland poems. Yeah. All right, so now can we please have Max? Oh dear, thank you, uh, Kiran, for saying the words, both Becky's words and Shauna. Because you know, she was just so sweet, she was so smart and bright and sparkly. I really did love her, even though I met her so little times, but we had the lovely little chat. And um, I'm sorry, I was, I was saying no more. Um, she was a one off. And um, okay, I've actually thought we were doing our own stuff tonight. So I ran upstairs earlier and I grabbed the, the book. And I thought of um, Colin, but I said, there's a man missing from our circle at the moment. I meet him at the Singers Club and he'd probably go mad if I did a poem of his. So therefore, I, I will give him a little bit of my own turn on this. I just grabbed the first page and I just picked a poem at random and it's from Jory Murphy. And he's a man that does short and fruity poems. 
He also does very deep and very tender poems. He does have 14 books and I have managed to protect four or five of them in this house. So I'm going to do my usual. I'm going to embarrass myself doing an imp of the music. That'll probably really irritate him. So he won't be listening anyway, please God. Okay, so um, it's opened on a, on a poem. And of course, it opened on the kind of ones I love that he writes. And it's romance. So it happens to be one of his romantic jury modes. Okay, so can you hear me again? Okay. So I'm going to improvise a little bit of music. And I think knowing jury could have a small bit mischievous and a little bit of a tango maybe. So I'll try. <laughs> Brief romance. A flurry of snowflakes swirls a pop over the parapet of Half Moon Bridge and sweeps down Capwell Road. An empty taxi passes along the South Douglas Road, kicking up slush and hooting. Into the distance Inside my overcoat You're snuggling up to my chest One kiss leading through another And in the kitchen a carefree chef Is preparing his one and only specialty as all blues seeps in from the bedroom. Where a bedside lamp is picking out the henna glints of your glossy black hair while you read beautiful glasses. He's odes to the daughters of the lower middle class. <laughs> God, he's gas. I don't know. You never know what you're going to read. But... Okay. The early evening sky is dreaming you up between Sirius and Orion. And the exact blue gray of your eyes, the lighthouse is unfurling the black anarchist banner of your head over a flat, indifferent sea. I am sitting naked by the seismograph waiting for the warm aftershocks <laughs> that's still numb still numb from holding you and I'm in your arms lock the swaddling warmth of your skin <laughs> why did I pick this lulled by the drowsy heat of your heart nuzzling your breast <laughs> sorry like a sleep child Wondering which beams of morning light will draw you out and away again. <laughs> okay, here goes the tango for the last verse, nearly there. It has to be a bit naughty. There's something almost zen like about the way you turn up that night. I waited with extraordinary concentration outside the appointed place long after the appointed hour trying to distinguish the sound of distant stars with a cheerful hum of the passing traffic we wish you well, Jerry, when you're missed. Sorry for more than your poem. <laughs> I think, you know, Jerry, he probably would want to hit you over the head with a frying pan. Deep down, he would love to I didn't, I wasn't like, going to say his name, <laughs> but I do, like, I do. Like, Respect. It's the most beautiful contradiction he does. You're like, you're right. He has the cheekiest, wishiest little poems and then the most tender. Um, yeah. yeah. He's a so, naughty yeah. rogue. Hitting but you over the head and hugging you at the same time. Mags, for sure. Charisma. Oh, he, he, he hits charisma, but he wouldn't like you saying that. And he certainly wouldn't like me singing this song. <laughs> this is 
Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, well, thank you, Mags. Thank you very much. And um, I'm going to finish because unless there's anybody else that really wants to. Massimo, go for it, Massimo. Brilliant. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's been really lovely so far. I, I always enjoy it. Um, so this poem, I think, I think it's called My Heart. Um, my heart, sit only with those who know and understand you. Sit only under a tree that is full of blossoms. In the bazaar of herbs and potions, don't wander aimlessly. Find the shop with a potion that is sweet. If you don't have a measure, people will rob you in no time. You will take counterfeit coins, thinking they are real. Don't fill your bowl with food from every boiling pot you see. Not every joke is humorous, so don't search for meaning where there isn't one. Not every eye can see, and not every sea is full of pearls. My heart, sing the song of longing like the nightingale. The sound of your voice casts a spell on every stone, on every thorn. First, lay down your head, and then one by one, let go of all distractions. Embrace the light and let it guide you beyond the winds of desire. There you will find a spring and nourished by its sea waters, like a tree, you will bear fruit forever. And that's by Rumi. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's kind of cool to think he wrote that like, you know, 600 years ago. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks, Linda. Well done. Very cool to think that he wrote it 600 years ago. And let's just hope that we, the message sinks in. Because we really need it to, don't we, guys? We really do. Um, thank you all so much. Well, I feel like a little bit emotional. Maybe it's the age I'm at. I don't know. Sue, let's stick that one in the Bible and the age I'm at and the emotions I feel. But um, amazing, you're all amazing. Poetry is amazing, it's such a medicine. Um, and I wanna end the night with a poem by Jack Shortland. And thank you, Shauna, because uh, I'd been Googling Jackie and I wasn't finding anything. So when you said that, I just Googled and the first poem that came up is the one I'm gonna share with you because I'm gonna just take that as a gift from the lady herself and from the, the place beyond, if that's okay with everybody. Um, so I didn't know Jackie that well, but I always really enjoyed her, her presence. And she did, she, yeah, she had a great like playful sense about her. Uh, she was just up for the crack, but like that, just hearing um, yourself and Kiron read her poems, I was like, wow, there's so much more wisdom there that maybe I didn't connect to so much on the nights, you know, because uh, I'm, I'm not always great at listening for hours on end. So, uh, so I'm going to share this, this last one, and this one's for Jackie, and it's for all of you, because I know she loved everybody, and she loved a veil, and I guess what we all love about it. Yeah, that uh, connection that words bring. Okay, chalky gods. You wouldn't make a daisy chain for the crucifix hanging in my mother and father's bedroom with the wounds uncovered. It uncovered, it felt cold. You wouldn't make a daisy chain for the big red statue on the turn of the stairs going up and coming down with its hands and heart exposed. You wouldn't want to make a daisy chain for them, 
the chalky gods that were wedding presents and not really for adoration in our house. But I did make a chase daisy chain for one who stood there in the low light outside our room, a little or Mary, or a little or lady. I made a secret daisy chain and placed it carefully around her tilted head and hooked it over her prayer hands and onto her feet. I made a daisy chain for her and because I couldn't put a candle, I put a seashell where I knew she'd like. So let's all put a seashell where Jack Shortland would like it in our minds right now. I actually thought about her just about a week ago and I never th thought about her along the way, really. Uh, so, uh, and that, I just looked up the dates. That was kind of around the time. It happens to me more often. It's kind of scary. Yeah. Kind of scary and kind of beautiful too. We are all connected, um, which, is, which is good. It's a good thing to, to know and to feel. Um, and on that note, I'm going to say goodbye to our Facebook guests and our YouTube guests. Thank you for joining us tonight. I uh, hope you enjoyed the poetry. I know I did. Um, Thank you. Nice. Good night. Good night.